Board of Trustees. Uh, Sarah, would you start us off by taking the role, please? Oh. Uh, I, I'll be taking the role. That's a, a ah, staff right. to executive committee. Broughton? Here. Cisneros? Here. Stalin? Stalin? Was here a moment ago. Duran? Bertula? Here. Saleg? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll begin with a call for public comment. Uh, if there's any member of the public who would like to address the executive committee, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. I think everyone's online, there's no phone callers. Uh, I'm not seeing anyone with a hand up. So, all right, so we will move on to our agenda. We have nothing on our closed session agenda. Uh, I have no chair's report for this committee. Uh, there are no consent items. And so moving to the business agenda, item 3A is a proposed revision to State Bar Rule 3.662 regarding the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. And I'm sorry, before um, Duan gets started with that, um, Mr. Duran is in the uh, attendee side, if he could be promoted. And Dag, I'm back here. I, I, I saw you when I promoted you and have, have marked you as present. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I, shall I begin or? Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Dawn Wing and I'm the program manager in the Office of Access and Inclusion. Um, and I oversee the grant, the LUA grant program. So again, this agenda item deals with the state bar um, rule 3.62, um, which currently states that the board of trustees may appoint members of the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission for up to two um, three year terms. Staff proposes changing this rule um, so that we can align with the global recommendations that you passed a few years ago which sets the terms of appointments for all sub entities to see with the possibility of a reappointment to serve as an officer. So at the last board executive com committee meeting at this past March, um, this committee authorized a 30 day public comment period. Um, so I'll be reporting back on the public comments that we received. Um, the public comment period ran from April 1st through April 30th, and we received three public comments um, two public comments were in support of the proposal, and one, one public comment was in opposition, and I'll go through each of them right now. Um, there was one commenter who is a, a current member of the Legal Services Trust from, um, Commission who supported the proposal but didn't submit any, any additional comments. Um, the second commenter um, came from the Legal Aid Association of California, LAC. Um, LAC, if you're not familiar, is a statewide organization, a statewide membership organization um, comprised of 100, about a, over 100 legal aid nonprofit organizations, um, and many of them are IOLTA um, grantees. LAC uh, did express a support for the proposal as it stands, but does request the board um, to consider uh, more flexibility for, for terms of appointments for um, client eligible members. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, the, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission is comprised of uh, 24 members, um, 21 are voting. Um, the board uh, appoints a number of them, the Judicial Council appoints a number of them. There are four um, public members and of the four public members, two must be client eligible as defined by statute. Uh, so LAC uh, would like to implore the, the, uh, the, the board to consider a more flexible term limits for client eligible members, stating that they thought it would be um, detrimental to lose dedicated and eligible client members um, due to term limits. Uh, the third public comment came from um, the California Access to Justice Commission. Um, and the Access Commission um, works towards achieving equal access to justice for all Californians. And they've been doing this work for about 20 years now. Um, the Access Commission um, did submit a letter um, that's included in your materials, and they expressed concern that the proposed rule um, would unnecessarily reduce term length and thus the experience of, of, of serving commissioners. 
um, they further note uh, that the experience and well-informed commissioners um, provide integrity to, uh, to the funding and policy recommendations um, that are made by the commission, um, many of them that are then elevated to the Board of Trustees for approval. So staff has uh, carefully reviewed all the public uh, comments and considered them. And uh, we still reaffirm our initial um, recommendation of changing uh, rule 3.62 to align with the global recommendations um, and to summarize for the following reasons. Um, we think that the new term limits uh, would not only uh, en enable better coordination amongst um, the state bar in general, um, we, we think that it would encourage greater diversity and inclusion in the commission, um, not just uh, gender, uh, race, um, uh, ethnicity, um, but also geographic diversity. Um, right now, currently, uh, uh, the commissioners, uh, many of them are based in uh, San Francisco um, region or the Los Angeles region. Um, there are There's one current member um, that's in Eureka, a little bit more urban, uh, another that's in Sacramento, but we, we don't have a lot of geographic diversity. There's nobody um, on the commission um, that's in Central uh, California. Um, there used to be some commissioners that were in the Inland Empire and San Bernardino region. So we think that having term limits will increase uh, uh, you know, uh, the demography of uh, commissioners and especially um, geographic diversity. Um, we also want to note that uh, after we posted uh, the memo with our recommendation, uh, we did realize that the board book um, does have an additional provision um, for the uh, board of trustees that um, you may um, uh, you may uh, appoint uh, uh, commissioners or for sub entity volunteers for an additional term. Um, so you're not if this rule passes, you're not restricted by just this rule. If you found for some other um, reason that you would like to uh, appoint a, a legal services trust fund commissioner for an additional term, um, you would have that authority too. Um, we just think that it, it would be prudent um, to have the, the, the one year term limit so that we can encourage diversity and to align it with the other sub entities. So for that reason, um, staff does ask that the board executive committee recommends to the board of trustees um, to amend the state bar rule um, as set forth in attachment A. And I am happy to take any questions. All right. Discussion, questions? Uh, otherwise, would someone like to make a motion? I'll move the item, Mr. Chair. This is Jose, I'll second. Thank you. Motion by Ruben, second by Jose. Uh, I think we have the wrong resolution on the screen though. It's three, we want 3A. There we go. Uh, all right. The motion is to adopt the resolution shown on your screen. Uh, unless there's further discussion, then uh, Dag, please take the roll. Broughton. Broughton. Mark Broughton, are you on mute? There, somebody somebody took my screen. Yes. Disneros? Aye. Delin? Yes. Duran? Yes. Fertula? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, Duan. Uh, next is item 3B, approval, uh, proposed approval of additions to our legislative priorities. Uh, Dag, looks like you're presenting on this. That's correct. Um, this item requests executive committee approval for the addition of uh, support, in particular uh, three letters of support for bills uh, that have either been introduced or have been amended and that we believe um, directly address interests of the state bar and um, uh, values that are uh, embodied within the state bar strategic plan. AB 1487 would establish a homelessness prevention fund to be administered by the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. The amount is as yet to be determined, uh, but the funds would be distributed to tenants uh, uh, for, for legal services, education and outreach reach in landlord tenant disputes. Uh, Assembly Joint Resolution 12 urges the US Congress to revise the US code to allow for benefits that are uh, distributed under the GI Bill to be used for uh, California accredited and unaccredited law schools. 
Uh, currently, uh, the U.S. code requires that law schools must be either ABA accredited or accredited by a special accreditor, accreditor that would allow the, uh, the person attending the law school to uh, sit for any bar exam in any state. Those conditions do not apply to California uh, uh, non unaccredited law schools and also do not apply to a number of accredited law schools. Finally, uh, SB 770 uh, would appropriate $10 million uh, to support uh, the, to expand the Pathways to Law School program, which is a partnership between high schools and community colleges. As I mentioned at the outset, all of these bills um, fall squarely within the state bar's strategic goal four um, to improve access to justice and uh, diversity in the legal profession. And so we would, uh, upon approval by the executive committee, uh, be looking to send letters of support uh, of these bills. All right, thank you, Dag. Uh, any discussion or questions from members of the board, uh, committee? Hearing none, would someone like to make a motion? Jose, I'll make a motion. Thank you. Duran, I'll second. All right, motion by Jose, second by Ruben. Um, seeing no further hands raised, Dag, please take the roll. Broughton. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. Delenn. Yes. Duran. Yes. Petula. Yes. The motion carries. All right, thanks everyone. This will complete uh, a very concise meeting of the executive committee. And uh, so we will adjourn. And next up is uh, the regulation and discipline committee. All right, good morning, everyone. Let's try to do a quick check here on members. Um, Lisa, do we have everybody on that needs to be on? Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. You need Jeff Del Cerro in. When you get to the um, first closed session business item. That's going to be trailed to the end of the agenda. OK. Um, I, I don't see the wrong. Trustee Has she reached out to anybody as far as scheduling this morning? Uh, she is not available uh, for the meeting today. Okay. okay. All right. Then, well, I'm going. Oh, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. And then just Adela Cruz, Trustee Adela Cruz. Any word from him? Uh, I I do believe he uh, he emailed the other day and indicated that he would be late. Okay. Okay. And then, All right. And then Trustee Sewell. Oh, I see him. There he is. Yep. Okay. Sure. All right. Well, let's uh, call the meeting to order then. Uh, Lisa, please take the roll. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Broughton. Here. Chen. Here. Santos. Here. De La Cruz. Duran. Here. Gadong? Pertula? Here. Soleil? Here. Shelby? Present. Sewell? Present. Tony? Present. Okay, and stalling. Okay, we have a quorum.
Stalling? All right, yes, I'm here. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another fun and exciting day uh, here at the Regulation and Discipline Committee. Uh, we, as you see on our agenda, uh, closed session item is first up. However, um, we're going to trail that to the end of the agenda for those who are um, who are tuning in today to uh, uh, to participate in this meeting. Uh, so that will be trailed. I think it will probably be um, heard around 9:40 uh, for those of you who uh, would like to wait till then. So Jeff, if you're hearing this, probably about 9:40 is when we'll get to you. Uh, so at this time, I would like to make a, a call for public comment. Uh, if there's any individuals who wish to address um, RAD, uh, please indicate uh, by raising your hand in Zoom uh, or um, if on a phone, notify staff. Um, Lisa, are you going to be monitoring that or is that going to be DAG? DAG usually helps me with that. Okay. Just ask that uh, member that uh, public commenters keep their comments to around three minutes uh, so we can uh, perform the work of this uh, committee and so you can be heard. All right. Whichever staff member is monitoring, are there any raised hands in the attendee side? There are not. Okay. All right, we will uh, move on then to chair's report. I'm going to uh, give my chair report uh, during the uh, Board of Trustees meeting. We'll now go to consent. Are there any members who wish to pull any items off of consent? Okay, seeing none, uh, I just need a second on this in order to go to a vote. I'll second, Mr. Chair. All right, second by uh, Mr. Duran. Lisa, could you please take the roll? Button? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Duran? Yes. Denong? Pertula? Yes. Salig? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Yes. Tony? Aye. Okay, consent agenda has passed. All right, thank you. Going on to item 3A is a formal advisory ethics opinion. Uh, and this is a request for approval for publication. And presenter, we have Mr. Tuff. So Mr. Tuff, welcome. And please uh, walk us through this agenda item. Uh, thank you and good morning, everybody. Uh, this ethics opinion addresses what ethical obligations arise when a lawyer in a law firm is suffering from an impairment that is causing the impaired lawyer to either violate the rules of professional conduct or the State Bar Act while representing a client. Uh, the opinion went out for public comment twice. And during the second round of public comment, the committee received five public comments including comments from both the Los Angeles County Bar Association and the California Lawyers Association Ethics Committees, who stated they agree with the analysis and the conclusions of the opinion, that they support its publication, and they believe the opinion is of vital importance to practicing lawyers and the protection of the public. The opinion, however, did receive a critical comment from the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office. Uh, they disagreed with the opinion, and in particular, take issue with a statement in the opinion that says, and I'll quote, each lawyer in a law firm has an independent ethical obligation to protect the interests of the firm's clients. And that's the end of the quote. And uh, the LAPD says that this proposition is flawed and not applicable to situations where only a particular division or branch of a law firm is involved in the representation. Uh, the committee closely considered this concern, but they disagreed with the limitation that's provided by the commenter and observed that the statement in the opinion is supported by both the rules of professional conduct and case law. Koprak also uh, observed that the commenter is focusing on a single sentence, but when read in context, the committee believes the opinion is clear that the proposition is predicated by a lawyer's knowledge of the impaired lawyer's conduct. Uh, so for example, this opinion focuses on ethical obligations of a supervising attorney and a subordinate attorney who know of an impaired lawyer's conduct. And uh, part of the opinion analyzes rule of professional conduct 5.2, 
which is a new rule as of 2018 in the state of California. And that rule addresses the responsibilities of a subordinate lawyer, which provides that a subordinate lawyer must comply with the rules of professional conduct and the State Bar Act, notwithstanding the fact that, they, that, the, that, that a subordinate lawyer acts at the direction of a supervisory or managerial lawyer in a law firm, and thus has an independent ethical obligation to protect the interests of the client. As a result, a subordinate lawyer in a law firm who knows of an impaired lawyer's misconduct is not excused from fulfilling their own ethical professional responsibilities simply because they are a lower, lower level or subordinate attorney. Um, all that being said, in order to address, um, or at least to respond to the concern raised by the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office, COPRAC did add additional language to the opinion in order to reiterate that the duties discussed in the opinion are limited to attorneys with knowledge of the impairment or the misconduct. And after having considered uh, all the comments received, uh, the committee is requesting uh, approval by RAD to publish this opinion on the State Bar's website. And, and Andrew, uh, could you just for the uh, benefit of some of the uh, newer members and also for uh, non-practitioners, uh, talk a little bit about what a ethics opinion is and how it's um, how it's used by the state bar and then um, disseminated to lawyers in order to protect the public? Sure. So um, I'm going to bifurcate that question because there's a procedural question and there's the practical question of how they're used. So procedurally, the committee develops an ethics opinion. They either receive a request to develop an ethics opinion from lawyers or members of the public, questions that they think are difficult for either practitioners or the public to understand or analyze. And the committee considers those requests and either uh, agrees to develop an opinion on those topics or uh, respectfully declines, uh, or the committee develops uh, the topics themselves. And um, they meet every uh, five or six weeks and they develop these opinions as a very iterative process. And um, pursuant to their rules, they go out for public comment. And typically the first round of public comment is always 90 days and they welcome public comment. Uh, in particular, local county bar associations have uh, ethics committees which have very seasoned practitioners who can see issues um, and other observations that are just very helpful because when you are focused on your task, um, you know, you're not seeing uh, the forest uh, from the trees. And so having this outside perspective is always helpful and the committee welcomes that. And that there are sub substantive revisions to an ethics opinion after having received public comment, it will go out for an additional public comment period. So that occurred with this, with this opinion. And then following um, consideration of all the public comments, uh, pursuant to the committee's rules as directed by the board. Uh, it goes to RAD, just so RAD can ensure that the committee has gone through their procedures. And um, once approved by RAD, it is published on the State Bar's website. And opinion, ethics opinions are non-binding, they're advisory only, uh, but uh, to brag a little bit, they are quite helpful. And um, oftentimes they're cited by uh, appellate courts and even the California Supreme Court. And we take great pride in that when that occurs. It doesn't occur all the time, uh, but it has occurred a handful of times. And, um, and so they're just very helpful to practitioners, uh, the public, as well as uh, judicial officers. Um, so I think I've answered your question, Brandon, but if not, I'm happy to um, address anything I missed. No, it definitely answers mine. Are there any uh, members of RAD that have any questions for uh, Mr. Tuft? Yes, uh, Mr. Duran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Tuft, does the subordinate lawyer have an independent duty to go out and investigate facts, or is it just facts that they learn in the normal course of their uh, representing the client? It's the latter. So um, no one has... Uh, a lot of the rules of professional conduct are predicated on, on knowledge. Um, you, you have to know of, of, of misconduct or you know, knowingly uh, take, um, take action. Um, so to answer your question, it, it's, it's knowledge. But that statement leads a paragraph, which then narrows down to focus on the fact that a subordinate lawyer can't say, I'm just a subordinate. It's not my problem that I know you know, other lawyers in the firm might be engaging mis in misconduct or that my supervisor is failing to communicate the settlement offer uh, to the client. The subordinate lawyer in that example, 
according to the analysis of the committee, has an independent obligation to raise that concern to their supervisor. If it can't be resolved and you're in a larger firm environment, maybe uh, discuss it with another supervising lawyer in that example. If you're just in a small firm environment, it's only one subordinate lawyer with a senior attorney, it's just the two of them working. The subordinate lawyer might have to make a difficult decision to actually communicate directly with the client um, that there's a problem. And um, that's the analysis that this opinion undertakes. Thank you. All right, any further questions? Any discussion? Uh, may I have a motion? So moved to I'll approve second. staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay, so it was a first by Ruben, second by uh, Mr. De La Cruz. The resolution is up on the screen now, resolved at the Regulation and Discipline Committee following publication for public comment and consideration of the comments received and upon recommendation of the State Bar Standing Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct approves the publication of formal ethics advisory opinion 2021-206 attached here to as attachment A. Uh, is there any further discussion? All right, Lisa, could you please take the roll? Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De Cruz? Yes. Duran? Yes. Godog? Pratula? Yes. Salig? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Yes. Tony? Aye. Okay, motion All right, thank you. you go to item uh, 3B, which is Arbitration Advisory 2021-01, and this is a request for approval uh, for publication. So we again hear from Mr. Tuff. So please take us there. Okay, uh, so switching gears a little bit, uh, now we're discussing an arbitration advisory and uh, following the 2017 Task Force on the Governance and Public Interest and the Board of Trustees Appendix I review, the Board of Trustees retired the Committee on Mandatory Fee Arbitration and transferred the function of drafting arbitration advisories to COPRAC. And the purpose of an arbitration advisory is, is different than that of an ethics opinion in that an arbitration advisory serves to provide guidance to volunteer arbitrators regarding disputes or issues that may arise in connection with mandatory fee arbitrations. <clears throat> Excuse me. The board's resolution that transferred the responsibility for drafting arbitration advisories to COPRAC instructed COPRAC to develop and disseminate arbitration advisories in the same manner as ethics opinion. So uh, Brandon, thank you for your question before. Um, the arbitration advisory goes through the same process as I, I just described previously in terms of public comment and, and responding to public comment. And this arbitration advisory summarizes existing law and is intended to provide guidance to arbitrators on disputes concerning costs and expenses. And three public comments were received uh, concerning the arbitration advisory. And the most critical comment was submitted by Carol Langford. And uh, Ms. Langford um, does not believe that the arbitration advisory should permit an attorney to charge for an overhead or administrative expense, even when those charges are conditioned upon disclosure and client consent. And COPRAC considered this comment and the concern and believes that the arbitration advisory accurately reflects current legal authorities on the topic, which find that without disclosure to the client in advance of the engagement, a lawyer's overhead expenses are included in the lawyer's fees and may not be charged to the client as an additional cost. Um, the committee also noted that the arbitration advisory states that such costs remain subject to scrutiny for necessity reasonableness and fairness. Um, however, in order to address uh, some of Ms. Langsford's concern, COPRAC revised the arbitration advisory to add an additional reference, stating that, all, in a, stating that although an, uh, an attorney may recover expenses for items traditionally viewed as overhead when they are clearly disclosed in the fee agreement and agreed to by the client, such expenses must be reasonable under the circumstances. And after considering all of the comments received on the arbitration advisory, this item is requesting uh, approval to publish the arbitration advisory on the State Bar's website. 
All right. Are there any questions for Mr. Tuft? Any discussion on the resolution? All right, I have a motion. I'll I'll move the uh, I'll move the item. This is Chen. All right. First by Trustee Soul, second by Trustee Chen. I know there is the the dog in the background. I don't think any further. Um, I didn't hear any any other uh, requests for discussion on this. But any other I believe, discussion? I believe the, that was my dog. I apologize. No worries. We yeah. We'll just add it to the uh, Zoom repertoire. He's a tough guy. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, any further discussion? All right, Lisa, please take the roll. Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. Dela Cruz? Yes. Duran? Yes. Benog? Pratula? Yes. Saleg? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Zoll? Yes. Tony. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Excellent work. Thank you, uh, Andrew and your team for putting these agenda items together. Thank you. All right. We're going to move now to item 3C. So if we could promote the presenters on this. Should be Gug and Deep Carr and maybe Suzanne Grant. All right. All right. Good morning, Ms. Carr and Ms. Grant. Uh, we are presenting on item 3C. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that. Um, so in this item, staff proposes to amend California Rules of Court Rule 9.23. So currently Rule 9.23 provides the state bar a process for requesting entries of money judgment for I'm sorry, outstanding discipline costs and CSF reimbursements that are part of disciplinary order. So the state bar can enforce, collect basically the outstanding debt in these areas. It also provides a process for requesting compromises of these judgments. Um, the recent developments, um, as I'll discuss in a few minutes, um, expanded the state bar's authority to enforce additional types of amounts owed to the state bar as money judgments. Um, so the staff is recommending amendments rule 9.23 to provide the process to allow the state bar to request those entries of judgment. Um, the amendments to California Business and Professions Code section 6140.5 that became effective January 2021 authorizes the state bar to enforce as money judgment all CSF final determination. So not just those that are pursuant to a disciplinary order, and it also removes the state bar's authority to compromise judgments um, for CSF reimbursements because Superior Court has original jurisdiction over California uh, client security fund reimbursements um, and any related issues. Additionally, in March 2020, the California Supreme Court approved a state bar court rule 5.137, which imposes guidelines for the imposition of monetary sanctions pursuant to Business and Professions Code section 6086.3. This rule 5.137 provides that monetary sanctions can also be enforced as money judgments um, and collected by any means provided by law. So based on these two developments that have taken place, the staff is proposing that we amend rule, uh, California Rule of Court 9.23 by one, adding that the state bar has authority to enforce as money judgment, all CSF final determinations, as well as monetary sanctions. Also adding a new provision in the rule that allows the state bar and the debtor the right to file a motion to amend, vacate, or stay enforcement of judgments within a specified time frame. Also adding a new provision along the state bar to um, bring similar motions 
at any time for the benefit of the debtor in terms of correcting an error or halting any collections efforts. We also propose clarifying that the state bar's authority to compromise money judgments entered for, uh, for disciplinary costs and monetary sanctions because, as I mentioned earlier, Superior Court has jurisdiction over client security fund reimbursements. And lastly, clarifying that the California Supreme Court's authority to alter the court ordered amounts, um, such as disciplinary costs, monetary sanctions, and court order restitutions, it's limited to that. Um, the two areas where um, we're requesting that the state bar be able to file a motion to amend or vacate or stay enforcement of judgment or the debtor be able to do that. The reason for that is currently there is no similar process like that um, that a state bar or the debtor can use to bring similar types of motions. We end up relying on process that exists for sm small claims court judgment or for um, superior court judgments. So since rule 9.23 provides process for requesting entries of judgment, it made sense to include a similar process for if any changes need to happen to those judgments. Um, basically those are the types of amendments we're seeking. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to address those at this time. Um, I just wanna add uh, one, one thing to that is that um, this rule is being requested, proposed rule is being requested for public comment for 45 days. And after that, um, once it's approved, we do need to submit it to the California Supreme Court um, for their approval. All right, any uh, questions from members of RAD? Right. I know that uh, during the bench bar uh, coalition meetings, uh, defense has uh, had this as one of their um, uh, items of, of discussion. So look forward to hearing from ADDC during the public comment period. Um, so I would just uh, add that to, to the discussion here. Is there any other discussion? Move the item, Mr. Chair. Jose, I'll second. First by Mr. Duran, second by Mr. Cisneros. Uh, any further discussion? All right, Lisa, please take the roll. Um, yes. Chen. Chen. Yes. <clears throat> Cisneros. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Duran. Yes. Dunog. Uh, Pertula. Yes. The Lake. Yes. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Sol? Yes. And Tony? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you to the Office of General Counsel and our two assistants who, uh, Assistant General Counsels who presented on that. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item 3D is the Discipline System Statistical Report. And that's brought to you by our very own Lisa Chavez. Good morning, everyone. Um, Excited to uh, just give a brief presentation on uh, the Discipline System Statistical Report. I'll be very brief, but I feel like I need to engage in a little level setting for our new trustees. Uh, so you may be asking yourself, how does this report uh, differ from the metrics report that is uh, attached to an item on the Board of Trustees agenda? And it differs in two, uh, three major ways. Uh, first is that whereas the metrics report um, looks at the most recent time period for the purpose and examines data for the purpose of accountability. This report takes those metrics and instead gives you the last 13 months worth of data. Another thing this report does is provide additional data to give context to those metrics. <clears throat> and then finally, this report contains analyses uh, that we've done on post disposition outcomes and the complaining witness survey. And so let me just give you really quickly an example. In the metrics report, there's a, a chart that looks at the um, annual caseload clearance rate for OCTC, and we analyze the last several months. The DSSR is going to give you 13 months worth of data, so you can see how this has changed or not over the last year. Here's an example of where the DSSR gives additional contracts to metrics. So for example, on the left, this is a chart in the metrics report that looks at successful completion of probation. Um, and these are just rates expressed in terms of percentages. 
but in the DSSR, you can actually see the number of probation cases that were closed. In other words, the number of cases that on which the chart on the left is based. And so anyway, that's, I just wanted to give a little context of how these two reports speak to each other and how you can make use of them. And I'll just close by saying that the State Bar recently acquired Power BI, and we are moving towards putting all of these uh, charts and data online. And so this would be an example, say like this chart on the left, you'd be able to hover over it you see the value, the percent, that's what really you're measuring, but you'll hover over it and then you would see the number of cases. And so we're really excited about this development and I look forward to uh, sharing that with you in the coming months. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions about the DSSR? Okay, thank you. All right. No action needs to be taken on this item. So uh, unless there are any questions for Ms. Chavez, we will move to now the uh, closed uh, section uh, item of the agenda. And this is closed pursuant to government code section 11126 sub C sub two. And for members of the public who are uh, listening in, uh, this should last approximately 20 minutes, should reconvene back into the um, open board session um, at about 10 o'clock. And then it's my understanding that we're going to go into closed session at that point. So, Sean, are there any other instructions you want to give at this time? Or Ruben? Nope. Nope. Thank you. Okay. You should have received an email from me around 10 minutes ago with the link to that closed session. All right. Check your See everyone on the other side. <laughs>
All right, I think we have a majority of the RAD members now uh, back into open session. We have adjourned uh, the closed session of the RAD meeting and uh, no action was taken, uh, nothing to report out. So I will adjourn now the uh, RAD uh, meeting for May of 2021 and we'll go over to the Board of Trustees agenda and I'll hand it over to Chair Sean Seleg. All right, so um, I understand we're scheduled to start at one. So you have a leisurely lunch, late breakfast and lunch. Donna's taking your head, am I incorrect? Uh, so the closed session, we're gonna start with the, we're gonna adjourn, uh, recess open, go into closed session and the, the open session will return at one. Aha, uh -huh. um, good. And so, right, so you typically before we adjourn, we go into closed, we would uh, ask if there's public comment on the closed session items. Very good. Um, all right, so we're gonna stay on this link, so we're ready to roll. So uh, we will- I'm, I'm gonna, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Seelig, I'm gonna ask for a 10 minute break. Oh, that's fine. Let's have a 10 minute break. Let's come back, how about 12? We'll live it up. So we'll come back at 11 a.m., 12 minute break. Thank you. And I'm prepared to take roll, Chair. Uh, are we ready? Are we recording? Yes, we are. Okay, so uh, this will begin the uh, meeting of the Board of Trustees. Uh, Sarah, would you please take the roll? Broughton. Here. Chen. Cisneros. Here. De La Cruz. Here. Dellen. Here. Duran. Present. Trustee Ganong has previously informed us that she's not able to attend this meeting. So her absence will be noted for the duration. Okay. Pertula. Here. Shelby. Present. Sowell. Present. Stallings. Here. Tony. Present. Okay, Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. All right, so our plan for today is we are going to uh, begin with closed session. Uh, the open session will begin at, uh, it's scheduled to begin at one o'clock. Uh, we, this open session is to receive public comment on our closed session items, if any. Um, if you, if there's anyone listening who has public comment on our open session items, there'll be an opportunity for that when we uh, reconvene in open at one o'clock. So with that, let's begin with a call for any public comment on the closed session items. Uh, I see we have some attendees online. If you're interested in addressing the Board of Trustees, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, seeing no raised hands, we will go into closed session and uh, we're going into closed section, pardon me, closed session pursuant to government code sections 1126 to 111, sorry, I misspoke, sections 11126 through 11126.2. So trustees, please, uh, Exit this meeting and use the link that's been sent to you to join the closed session. I, I do suggest uh, that we uh, take the roll just because we're Absolutely. starting a fresh session. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So let me know when you'd like me to do that. Yeah, um, someone, uh, everyone who's not, if you're not speaking, go ahead and mute. There's someone has some uh, background noise coming through. Okay, uh, Sarah, please start recording and let's go ahead. Okay. We are recording. We are recording. Uh, Broughton. <laughs> Here. Chen. Cisneros. Here. De La Cruz. Here. Dellen. Here. Duran. Here. Um, Trustee Ganong is absent for the meeting. Uh, Pertula? Here. Shelby? Present. Sowell? Here. Stallings? Here. 
Tony. Present. Okay, you've got a quorum and you have everyone back. Thank you. All right, well, we're continuing with, uh, with our board meeting uh, just to set the table for uh, people following along this morning. We had a very brief open session with really no substance uh, other than ask for public comment. And then we went into closed session. We're now uh, gonna get to the substance of our open session items. And before we do that, uh, I'd like to make a call for public comment for anyone who would like to comment on the agenda items before the board today. So if you would like to address the board, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I'm not seeing any hands. All right, so. And will... Chair, excuse me, I would yes. just like to note for the record that um, Trustee Chen is present. Thank you, welcome, Hi, Lynn. All right, let's, um, let's proceed to uh, item 10, the minutes. Looks like we have three sets. That's correct. And unless there's discussion, could I hear a motion, please? So say I'll make the motion. Okay. okay. Sonia here, I second. Thank you. Oh. Motion by Jose, second by Sonia. Uh, if there's any discussion, don't see any, let's go ahead and I, take the roll. Excuse me, Chair, Chair Selig. I wanna yes. thank the staff for including uh, public comment in the minutes. Thank you. Hey guys, check it out. Hey, Nick, nice haircut. Oh, Ruben, your mic's open. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so we have a motion on the table to approve the three sets of minutes identified in the agenda. And now we'll take the roll. Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. Dela Cruz? Yes. Dellen? Yes. Duran? Yes. Pertula? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Sowell? Yes. Stallings? Yes. Tony. Aye. Okay, the, the minutes are adopted. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, the next item is the chair's report. Um, I just have a very brief report for you this time. Uh, I wanna let you know that the Ad Hoc Commission on the Discipline System had its first meeting on April 30th. It was a six hour meeting, very substantive, a lot of good discussion. Uh, we concluded by preparing a preliminary list of topics for the commission to study. Uh, the next meeting will be on May 24th and uh, the commission will meet in uh, through two subcommittees. So we've set up a subcommittee on fairness and a subcommittee on effectiveness. And so we're gonna start, uh, continue to, to flesh out our work plan and the issues we're gonna discuss and, uh, and keep busy. So uh, I wanna let you know that process is underway. Uh, the other thing is we have put before you a revised list. Uh, this is item 30-1, revised list of uh, committee liaison and special assignments for board members. Uh, with one change, Mark Tony has asked uh, not to be on the audit committee. So, uh, so I would invite a motion to approve this item with that change. Um, I seek some clarification here, uh, Chair. This is the Secretary. Um, I, th I, I thought the uh, item was to add Mark Tony to the audit, uh, audit committee, and that's what this item uh, intends to do. Um, is, is there oh, a different? Maybe there's nothing that needs to be done. Well, there's, uh, well Mark can speak for himself. Yeah, go ahead. I, I um, requested of, uh, of the Chair. Um, I had changed my mind and I let the chair know ahead of time. I had request, I want I had requested it. And then I had um, had second thoughts in terms of my time. And, and so I contacted uh, the chair prior to this meeting, you, um, you know, making that request that I, uh, so, so that's, that's how it happened. It, it's really oh. my fault. No, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, my clarification then is old, obsolete. And we could just consider this item withdrawn. Okay. It shall be. Uh, all right. Let me uh, let me get the agenda back in front of me. Bear with me for a moment. 
uh, next item is a report from the executive direct interim executive director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, am going to actually waive presentation of an oral report at this meeting. I would just direct you to the written report that was included with today's agenda, which touches on the importance of continuous improvement in both bold and ordinary ways. The report also tees up for the board uh, staff's intention to formulate and launch a comprehensive compliance review process, which will be addressed at a future board meeting. And so with that, I turn the microphone back over to the chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, next on the agenda is our consent agenda. Uh, so is there, uh, does any board member wish to pull an item from consent for discussion? Uh, seeing no hands, um, uh, I would welcome a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move the consent calendar. Thank you. I'll second. Uh, who's that? Dela Cruz. Oh, okay. So um, motion by Ruben, second by Juan. Uh, please take the roll. Rotten. Yes. Chan. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. Dela Cruz. Yes. Dellen. Yes. Duran. Yes. Pertula. Yes. Shelby. Aye. Sowell. Yes. Stallings. Yes. Tony. Uh, aye. Uh, the consent items are moved. Thank you. Um, next, we'll do reports of board committees, uh, starting with uh, item 110, board executive committee. Uh, so we, uh, the executive committee this morning, uh, approved three additions to our legislative agenda and Donna, you probably are more adept at explaining these. So if you would go ahead and just summarize those briefly. Actually, I'm gonna let Doug summarize those for you. Perfect, thank you. Yes, um, in monitoring legislative activity, um, staff identified three bills that we believe uh, merit support, a letter of support um, from the state bar. Uh, those are AB 1487. AB 1487 establishes a homelessness prevention fund, which would be administered by the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. And the funds would be distributed to tenants to provide legal services and conduct education and outreach programs in landlord tenant um, disputes. There's no, not a dollar figure associated with this yet. It's subject to an appropriation by the legislature, um, but uh, it would have an immediate and obvious impact upon the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission if uh, passed and would uh, improve our ability to provide access to justice to uh, needy Californians. Uh, another bill that we're looking for support on a letter of support is a, a joint resolution, Assembly Joint Resolution 12, which urges the United States Congress to revise the US code to allow uh, GI Bill benefits to be applied to uh, California law schools that are not uh, accredited by the American Bar Association. As currently written, the GI Bill is restrictive in allowing uh, benefits to be used for law schools. It's restrictive in a way that prevents um, beneficiaries from using those funds to uh, pay for unaccredited and even for some accredited California law schools. And then the final bill that we're um, looking for a letter of support on is SB 770. Uh, SB 770 looks to um, provide a $10 million appropriation to expand pathways to law, the pathway to law school program, which is a partnership between high schools and community colleges, which seeks to um, uh, diversify the profession at the earliest stages in the pipeline to a legal career by um, assisting students uh, to get into a legal career early in their uh, academic career. Okay, very good. Uh, any discussion, comments, questions about the executive committee's recommendation to you to add these three priorities to our legislative agenda? Ruben, Ruben. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just with respect to the last, um, the last initiative that DAG discussed, it, it 
it calls to mind the, the days when we used to meet in person. And I remember a particular board meeting where Judge Harbin Forte gave a very um, ex exhaustive presentation to the board about issues uh, just like that, essentially the pipeline into law school starting at high school and sometimes even earlier. So I'm very happy to see uh, this effort. And um, with that comment, I'll make the motion. Thank you. Arnie. Um, I just want to let the board know that I, I don't know if, to, if I have to abstain from the entire vote or whether or not this could be bifurcated in some fashion. AB 1487 uh, is a bill that the, um, the nonprofit that I'm an executive director of is uh, uh, very involved in and very engaged in. Uh, we've taken a support position on that bill in the role that I play there and a part of a big coalition and those sorts of things like that. And so I don't know if, if that somehow um, causes issues for me with, uh, with this uh, particular, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with, with my board vote here. So without knowing you know, more detail, because we didn't talk about this ahead of time, I, my response, my reaction is that it does um, and that you shouldn't uh, vote on this, but uh, I, then I think we'd have to bifurcate. Yes. Um, so let's do that. Um, Ruben, would you be willing to? Chair, see? would you like me to screen share the resolution so that we can see yes. what? Okay. Please, perfect. And while the secretary is bringing that up, Mr. Chair, of course, I'm happy to uh, bifurcate as necessary and, and so amend my motion. Okay, thank you. This is Brandon, I'll uh, second the bifurcated motion. Thank you. All right, so the present motion will be to add AJR 12 and SB 770 to our list of le legislative priorities. The leading 1487, right? Correct. And the comma. <clears throat> okay, all right. And the second, and the second comma. All right. Any further discussion, questions? Uh, Sarah, go ahead and do, take the roll, please. Um, Broughton. Sorry. Yes. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. Dela Cruz. Yes. Dellen. Dellen? Are you on mute? Oh, maybe she's frozen. Oh, it looks like it. Oh, okay. no, yeah. she's moving. Um, oh, sorry. Dellen? I'm sorry. I have no comments. I'm sorry. Um, do you want to cast a vote on uh, item number uh, 110? Yes, thank you. Okay, 112. 12. Uh, Duran. Aye. Pertula. Yes. Shelby. Aye. Sowell. Aye. Stallings. Yes. Tony. Aye. Okay, the motion, the bifurcated motion carries. Thank you. All right, uh, now would someone like to make a motion about AB 1487? Brandon, so moved. Shelby, second. Thank you. I'm sorry, can you repeat that, uh, Chair? Motion by Brandon, second by Melanie. Okay, I will just... Uh... I will fill in the rest. Uh, yeah, um, oh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's AB 1487. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> That's okay. Uh, 
Okay. Any discussion? I can't see everyone. So if you wait, uh, uh, Arnie. Do, do I just say abstain or pass or what's what's the what's the appropriate uh, response? Abstain. Abstain. Okay. Okay. If anyone else wants to speak, use the raise hand or or speak orally because I can't see everyone's uh, video right now. Okay. Don't hear anyone. Uh, so Sonia, go ahead and take. Uh, pardon me, um, Sarah. Please take the roll. Broughton. Yes. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Dellen. Yes. Duran. Aye. Bertula. Yes. Shelby. Oh, um, <coughs> Melanie, you have your mic muted. Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sowell. Abstain. Stallings. Yes. Tony. Aye. The second motion on this item carries. Thank you. Next up is item 120, report from the Regulation and Discipline Committee. Uh, Brandon. All right, thank you everyone. So I just wanna take a couple of minutes to highlight some of the work of Office of Chief Trial Counsel, staff, ORIA, RAD, and the members of our body. Uh, so as you all know, staff worked exceptionally hard to submit the annual discipline report to the legislator. And of note uh, to myself was the 5% uh, decrease in backlog and a continuation of looking at uh, the cases and prioritizing those in backlog that pose the highest public protection risk. Uh, the implementation of recommendations in addressing racial disparities in discipline was covered in the report uh, and really highlights uh, the steps that the bar is taking to uh, address these important issues. Our quality control in OCTC remained uh, high. We continue to uh, reach out to vulnerable populations with targeted services, meeting their unique needs. Uh, the report highlighted how uh, our staff is working remotely to protect the public. And then the client security fund payout of uh, over $11 million to, to 265 individuals to uh, try and right the wrongs of, uh, of lawyers who committed uh, who violated the rules of professional conduct, I think, uh, is, is definitely of note. Um, as Sean said, the uh, ad hoc commission uh, on the discipline system met for the first time, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work to improve our discipline process uh, in the areas of uh, fairness and effectiveness. And then lastly, our search for a permanent CTC has been in full force and effect, and uh, we have a finalist, uh, we have finalist interviews uh, scheduled on the Board of Trustees closed session agenda uh, later on, and we look forward to presenting a permanent CTC for Senate confirmation. So thank you, Sean. Very good. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, the next item is number 140, report from the Finance Committee. Jose. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, the Finance Committee is uh, moving all issues forward in uh, partnership with uh, State Bar staff and our uh, still new CFO, uh, Wallace Tang. Um, I do want to note uh, for the trustees that uh, one of the issues that the Finance Committee continues to work on is the area of real estate. Um, as everyone um, I'm sure well understands that the pandemic um, has created a, a number of changes in tumult in the real estate uh, marketplace. And so our analysis uh, that we were doing uh, will need to be prolonged and uh, understand new uh, necessities for both um, uh, uh, office usage and real estate opportunities. We'll be coming back uh, with more on that topic in the future. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, next is item 180, report from the Audit Committee. Sonia. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> at the April 28th meeting of the Audit Committee, the committee received a report of the results of the independent IT application security assessment from Chief Admin Officer Steve Mazur and IT Director Rick Rankin. Reviewing the results of the IT security assessments is part of the audit committee's work plan. In 2018, the bar did an independent network security assessment, which reviewed the bar's network infrastructure, such as servers, wireless networks, and routers. 
Another network security assessment will be conducted later this year. The assessment that was completed in April reviewed application security, looking at the bar's business applications themselves with a focus on high impact, high use applications, including external, which is public facing applications, internal, the state bar employee facing applications, state bar hosted applications and cloud-based applications, high impact, high use applications, which um, includes the independent assessment conducted by Aurora IT, a firm specializing in IT security. It included review of application code, review of database configurations, review of IT security policies, penetration testing on applications, databases, and servers. Aurora identified application security issues and assigned priority to them using the rubric likelihood of occurring and impact to the organization. 10% of identified issues were classified as critical or high priority. 90% were medium to low priority. The BARS IT um, team plans to have all critical and high priority issues remediated within 90 days, at which time the Aurora team will come back to review the remediation results. Medium and low priority issues are targeted for completion by the end of this year. The IT team is also incorporating the assessment findings into security policies and is its application development procedures. And finally, going forward, the bar plans to continue the practice of moving away from custom built in-house applications and instead using highly secured software as service platforms such as Oracle and uh, Salesforce. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you, Sonia. Um, okay, let's move on to our uh, business agenda, uh, beginning with item 701, which is the approval of certain contracts. And I believe Steve Mazur is going to present this item. You may need to be pulled in from attendees. There we go. No. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this item requests approval of contract amendments with ExamSoft to add the exam ID and exam monitor functions for the remote administration of the July 2021 bar exam and the October 2021 legal specialization exam. Uh, the details are included in the agenda item memo and staff would be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. All right, questions, discussion. Mark Tony. Thank you. I, um, I remain very unhappy with the exam soft contract with the lack of accountability that um, exam soft has been held up to, particularly um, looking at the number of complaints from the survey from the uh, February bar, bar, uh, bar exam. And I, I, I just believe that, or it may have been the October bar exam, but, but the point is that um, there are still a lot of complaints that are out there um, with uh, lack of customer service, people having to wait on uh, hold for long periods of time to get help and uh, technical glitches. And I don't believe that this board of trustees should be supporting a vendor who um, has these issues and um, you know, the, 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 the problems have not been addressed. So that's my comment. All right, anyone else? Yeah, Chair, um, as the uh, liaison to um, admissions, if you don't mind, I'd like to just address it for a moment. Um, I think um, Trustee Tony's 
concerns are very valid ones that um, we have looked at and continue to look at and think there's quite a bit of improvement. Um, I think there's um, an understanding that uh, the, this was the first time in October, it was, it was the October exam that had um, the survey. It was the first time we've given an online exam and there were quite a few um, issues, but much smaller than we expected. Um, and it's something that the staff is gonna continue to work with ExamSoft on. This is an incredibly important um, contract for the bar so that we can actually um, administer the exam um, going forward in the next two exams. That being said, um, Trustee Tony is absolutely right that there, there's quite a bit of improvement that needs to happen, especially in the customer service. And as the liaison, I can uh, uh, expect to continue to work on that matter. Thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, do I hear a motion? Jose, I'll move the motion. Thank you. Josh, I'll second. Thank you. Motion by Jose, second by Josh. Any further discussion? All right, Sarah, let's take the roll, please. Broughton. Yes. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Dellen. I think you're on mute again. Trustee Dillon. She I'll may have stepped away. Okay, I'll uh, come back. Yeah, move, you should move forward. I think she's gonna abstain on that. Okay. Duran? Yes. Pertula? Yes. Shelby? Abstain. Sowell? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? No. Okay. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, thanks, Steve. Next item is 702 Strategic Plan Status Report from our Interim Executive Director. Oh, Donna, you're on mute. Got it. Thank you very much. I wanted to go a whole meeting without having you say that to me. Um, <laughs> I'm going to share my screen right now. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity for a brief status update on the implementation of the 2017 to 2022 strategic plan, um, give you a, a sense of where we are on the many objectives that are set forth in the plan to move the needle, uh, move the needle forward in meeting the plan's goals and the state bar's mission. There we go. Um, so uh, just wanted to start with a quick reminder of where we were as of September 2020, uh, when we had the last formal update on the status of the strategic plan. Um, you'll see that the objectives for two of the plan's five goals were identified as completed at that time, um, with a number of objectives still in progress for the remaining three goals. The rest of this report, um, the rest of this presentation will highlight the movement that has been made on those remaining objectives since uh, that last report in September of 2020. So starting with um, goal two, which is briefly stated to ensure a timely, fair, and appropriately resourced admissions, discipline, and regulatory system, um, starting highlighting the additional objectives that were completed since our last report, um, since the update, last update, we've deployed the MCLE provider upload system, which will allow the bar to improve its monitoring of compliance with minimum continuing legal education requirements, ultimately giving us the capability to audit 100% of it, attorneys for compliance with their uh, triennial uh, minimum continuing legal ed education requirements. Additionally, since the last meeting, since the last uh, update, um, we can check off as completed the reporting of firm size and practice type. Um, the trustees will recall that at the last board meeting in March, you approved a mock-up of the of changes to the attorney profile. Um, since then, those changes that you approved have been implemented. If you go to the website and take a look at, at the profile, that those changes have been implemented. Um, the changes, though not part of the display, um, but the back end of the changes now require the reporting of firm size and practice type 
consistent with this strategic plan objective. This summer, we'll be promoting those changes to licensed attorneys to begin to get these fields populated. Uh, the final ob additional objective um, to note as having been completed um, uh, on this goal is um, uh, having to do with uh, evaluating the impact of the transition from a three-day to a two-day bar exam. Specifically, the objective was to look at the costs and the pass rate. Um, there were reports presented to CBE in 2019 on the impact of the pass rate. Uh, uh, December 2019 on the impact of the pass rate in December 2020 on the impact uh, uh, on the costs. Um, I would note that, that this analysis was based on exams that were conducted in July of 2017, February 2018, July 2018, and February 2019. The board specifically directed that the analysis be conducted following four exams um, that uh, were conducted in, in the two-day two format. Um, the key findings at a very high level were that there was uh, no impact on the pass rate. Um, on the costs, uh, there was a reduction in cost as a result of the transition to the two-day. Um, there were significantly more cost savings realized um, looking at the February exams than uh, comparing the July exams. But overall, the cumulative savings for all four exams over this period was $1.3 million. Those cost savings are attributable to a variety of factors, many of which we don't have uh, control over. Um, and they, the, um, they did not take into account any of the changes that have happened with the transition to the remote exam starting in October of 2020. Um, we still have three objectives. You'll see in the middle column here, three objectives that I expect to be completed in uh, 2021. Um, I would note um, that the objective that includes the workload study um, is actually a, a fairly lengthy objective. It includes several items to report and track the health and efficacy of the discipline system and to adopt measures to improve the fairness and efficacy of the discipline system. Um, beyond the language that's included in the objective, obviously additional efforts to assess and improve the efficacy and fairness will be driven by the work of the ad hoc commission. But as to the specific items noted um, in the objective, the one that is not yet completed is the workload study. Um, or more accurately, uh, the interpretation of the data gathered through the workload study um, to identify staffing and resource needs. Um, the final two objectives will continue um, uh, to, to the next, um, will continue past the end of the calendar year. Moving on to goal three. Um, goal three uh, set forth in the strategic plan is to improve the fiscal and operational management of the state bar, emphasizing integrity, transparency, accountability and excellence. You'll see that for this category, there was one goal um, that is still set to be completed in 2021 and one that, that may commence in 2021, but will not be completed before the end of, the, of this strategic plan. I do, however, wanna draw your attention to my third column um, on this slide. Um, as um, uh, the more tenured board, board, board members may recall, I, I've certainly taken more than one opportunity in the past to comment on my personal thoughts about the structure of uh, the bar strategic plan, um, which seems at least to me to be in part strategic plan, part operational plan, and maybe a bit of tactical plan thrown in for good measure. Um, I, I certainly look forward to participating with the board in shaping the vision for the next five years when the next planning session occurs in January. Um, I also look forward to addressing some of these structural issues. Um, so, so going back to the third column um, here, um, uh, you'll see I've identified, um, identified of the, of these as objectives that I believe are, are somewhat, uh, somewhat different than those with a clear start and end point. Um, I've designated these as objectives that are designed to be ongoing. Um, the two specific objectives referenced here, one is to improve productivity through performance accountability, training, and professional development. And the other is improve staff morale and career satisfaction through recognition of performance, career path development, transparent and collaborative communication, and recognition, recognition of encouragement of innovation, efficiencies, and money savings ideas. Um, I, I frankly think we would be doing a disservice to staff and to the organization as a whole if we were to say, you know, check, these items are complete. 
um, a, a smart and healthy organization must continue to keep these as goals um, throughout time. The bar has absolutely, without question, taken a number of steps to implement these, these, um, these goals, these objectives. Um, but if we're doing our jobs correctly, from my perspective, they should never be checked off the list or forgotten. The final goal that had um, objectives that were still in progress as of the last update was goal number four, um, which, um, which uh, sets out as the goal to support access to legal services for low and moderate income Californians and promote policies and programs to eliminate bias and promote an inclusive environment in the legal system and for the public it serves and to strive to achieve a statewide attorney population that reflects the demographics of the state's population. Starting with the additional objective that, um, that I think we can mark off as completed, um, the California Bar Exam Strategies and Stories Program um, uh, was first launched with the July 2018 bar exam. It's an intervention to improve bar exam performance. Uh, productive mindset interventions like this one mitigate the harms that are associated with concerns about potential belonging and stress and they help spur motivation and improve performance. This program was developed to help test takers find productive ways to interpret the challenges, obstacles, and negative psychological experiences associated with preparing for the bar exam. Its goal was to improve bar applicants' test-taking experiences and exam performance. Findings um, that the, um, from the researchers who are conducting this study, the findings from the first two administrations of it uh, yield very positive results with the most significant improvements in pass rates seen for applicants of color and first gen law school applica applicants. Um, and although we have not yet sort of uh, fully institutionalized this bar exam strategies and stories program going forward, and we have been able to continue to continue the work with the researchers and expand the program to the October 2020 bar exam, the February 2021 bar exam, and the upcoming July 2021 bar exam. Um, the, um, the presentation that's immediately following mine, and um, we'll talk more about, um, about this uh, bar exam strategies and stories program, as well as the other DEI objectives that are noted on this slide, which are currently in progress. So I won't, uh, I, I won't go through those at this point. Um, I would point the board again to the third column on this, on this slide. Um, as I was cataloging our progress for this meeting, I um, also identified these objectives as ones, ones that I do not believe have an end date. Um, there are certainly specific things that we, that we are doing to study approaches to increase access, to support education, um, to address issues that people do not identify as legal issues, and to uh, um, engage in efforts to attract and retain lawyers and legal aid. Um, there are efforts that we have begun and that will be completed before the end of the year. Um, but uh, again, I think it will be years, um, maybe long after, unfortunately, long after any of us are still in this business before we can stop paying attention to the needs um, to uh, take steps forward in each of these three areas. The final objective um, uh, that I wasn't frankly sure how to cat categorize, um, uh, goal objective D of goal four was really about the work of the access through um, innovation and legal services uh, working group. Um, as uh, many of the board members know, the board that working group completed its work in 2020 when the board accepted its report and acted on recommendations from that working group. However, the adoption of the recommendations from that working group led to the formation of the closing the justice gap working group. Um, which has really just started its work. Um, and so they will not be presenting a, and are not scheduled to present a report to the board um, until uh, late in 2022. And so uh, we could consider that objective either completed if we think about it as related to the first working group or, or delayed if we think about it as uh, related to the ongoing work that our closing the justice gap working group is, uh, is engaged in. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, questions, comments? This is, I believe, just informational, so 
we don't need a resolution. Okay. All right. Mr. Chair, I, I think Arnie has it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it, sorry. No, no, no problem. It's just real quick. Donna, how often do you do this? Um, I think we do it as, as <coughs> Sarah may be in a better position to remind me. I think we do it in May and September. <coughs> and then the July board, July board meet, I'm sorry, the January board meeting, of course, is, is our annual planning session. So there, there's a little bit of this woven into that, but not, uh, not a full update. Okay. <clears throat> I may want to just talk a little bit more about this in our, when we do our one-on-one -on -one, uh, weekly, just to understand the case <coughs> and uh, uh, opportunities for input. Absolutely. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Ruben. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to very quickly uh, thank Donna and the staff that works uh, with her and for her. Uh, one, for putting together the presentation that I think um, reminds me that there's just a lot going on at this organization um, at, you know, beyond what I, I deal with on a regular basis. Um, and it's multifaceted and it's a lot of work in the face of um, some daunting challenges that we've been through over the past 15 or 16 months. So uh, my personal thanks, Donna, to you and your staff uh, for the progress that you made on, on some pretty important goals. There's still some work to be done, obviously, but that's okay. That's, you know, that's sort of the, the way of the world. So um, thank you. Thank you. I'll make sure to pass that along to staff. Well said, Ruben. Thank you. Uh, further discussion, questions? Okay, all right, not hearing any further discussion, then I will move on to item, uh, and thanks again, Donna, for that. I'll move on to item 703, discussion of the biennial diversity report. And Elizabeth Palm looks like is joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will share my screen now. Um, Okay, so um, I want to thank um, the, Mr. Chair and the board for the opportunity to uh, share with the board the diversity, equity, and inclusion plan for 2021 and 2022 that was uh, reported to the legislature in March of this year. Uh, as you can see, um, Business and Professions Code section 6001.3 uh, requires the state bar to develop and implement a plan to demonstrate our ongoing commitment to um, enhance access, fairness, and diversity in the profession and uh, eliminate um, bias in the practice of law. Uh, we are required to prepare and submit this report every, report every two years, beginning um, in March 2019. Um, and we are allowed to include an assessment of needed revenue for this work. Uh, so in 2019, we did not include that information. Um, but for 2021, we did include an assessment. Um, so the report to the legislature was really centered around um, the state bar mission, as well as our strategic plan. Um, and as you all know, diversity and inclusion was included in the state bar mission in 2017. Um, and then the statutory mission was uh, amended effective 2019 to include the same. Also in 2019, the board amended the strategic plan to include for the first time specific diversity and inclusion goals. Um, and I uh, want to, you know, uh, underscore that the board was very thoughtful in determining how to prioritize diversity and inclusion and focused on areas where the state bar could be the most impactful as a regulatory agency. Uh, with input from stakeholders, including from the sub entity, the Council on Access and Fairness, the board focused um, efforts in um, pipeline to the profession, beginning with law schools and bar exam retention and advancement in the profession, and supporting judicial diversity. Additionally, recognizing um, the state bar's ability to collect and analyze data, um, the board also prioritized um, collecting and analyzing licensee demographic data and publishing an annual report card on the, state's, uh, the, on the state of the diversity of our profession. 
Um, so uh, these five areas are the um, state bar areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI focus. Um, and so um, this was how it was presented in the report to the legislature. And so I want to use this as a roadmap for this presentation. Um, so first I will go through um, these five areas and the accomplishments of the last two years. And then I will um, go over the areas again uh, with our plans for the uh, 2021 and 2022. So, and I would just note that um, that I've asked Elizabeth um, <clears throat> to uh, to keep the um, the discussion of what we've done over the past two years at at a high level. Um, although uh, it was a um, sort of a, a, a internal debate that I had, we want to take every opportunity to highlight the good work that was done in this area. I do feel like we have talked about quite a lot of it in various. Uh, various meet, several meetings, various venues um, with trustees and with the public. And so we wanted to take an opportunity to remind you of that, but not to, uh, not to go in depth on what we've done in the past, but to focus more heavily on what we're, what we're, we're planning to do in the future. Thank you, Donna. Uh, so with uh, statewide leadership, uh, as you all know, we um, have been conducting an attorney census uh, that goes along with the licensing fee payment process during that time period. Um, and with that, we collect, uh, we request uh, attorneys to report their demographic data. And we also ask questions related to retention and advancement to get a better understanding of issues related to satisfaction, belonging, and inclusion in the profession. Um, and uh, using this, the 2019 data, we published our report card on the diversity of California's legal profession last summer. Um, the report card includes calls to action for employers and attorneys um, to um, suggest some actionable steps that um, uh, both of those groups can take uh, to uh, advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in the profession. Um, we've also used um, diversity summits as a way to bring together leaders in the profession to um, share out the data, um, get feedback, um, and discuss um, uh, particular issues uh, that are relevant. Um, in 2019, we were able to hold an in-person summit um, and included uh, many leaders from affinity bar associations as well. Uh, from that summit, we, we uh, got a lot of feedback that each sector in the profession has um, its own um, challenges and solutions. And so for 2020, we opted to have sector specific summits. So last year we held a private sector summit in September and a nonprofit sector summit in uh, December. Uh, we've also had the opportunity to share out the census data as well as the report card widely um, at various um, local and affinity bar association meetings as well as at conferences. Um, our, the second area is uh, creating a culture of diversity. Um, and really this begins with raising awareness uh, about DEI issues. And so internally on the staff side, uh, we've implemented impl implicit bias trainings for staff and have made available um, quite a few DEI resources for staff um, and the opportunity to engage more in this subject area. Um, and then additionally, um, the board approved last year um, a rule change to double the elimination of bias MCLE credits from one hour to two hours um, and requiring that one of those two hours be on implicit bias. Um, and um, currently the Council on Access and Fairness is working to develop a one hour implicit bias MCLE that will be made available for free uh, on the state bar's e-learning portal for all attorneys. Um, and we hope that will be um, made available later this summer. In the area of pipeline to the profession um, in supporting law school retention efforts, um, as uh, some board members may recall, we've presented date, uh, data to the board in the past on law school attrition. Um, however, that data was incomplete um, because uh, we have in California, American Bar Association, ABA accredited law schools, as well as California accredited and registered schools. Um, and the data that the ABA schools report is uh, a bit more complete than the data from the California accredited and registered schools. Uh, so um, to address that issue in 2019 and 2020, staff worked with the California accredited and registered schools to develop enhanced demographic reporting. Um, and so that began in 2020 where they were reporting um, additional data. And this is a three year phased approach to the reporting. So we do hope in the very near future to be able to um, have a more complete picture of law students in California. 
Additionally, to ensure uh, bar exam question development and grading analysis are free from bias, uh, there was the differential item functioning diff analysis uh, for essays and performance test questions. Um, and as you know, there was um, overall no major areas of concern. However, uh, the board did establish the diff working group, which is made up of uh, CBE, Commis Committee of Bar Examiner and COAF members um, to uh, further examine um, the analysis and um, uh, issue a report, which we um, anticipate will be later this year. As Donna mentioned in her report, to improve performance on bar exam, uh, there is the California Bar Exam Strategies and Stories Program, which uh, in its uh, first two applications, uh, the results were very promising, uh, showing that um, uh, pass rates improved for underrepresented minority bar takers by an estimated 16 percentage points, and um, the probability of passing for first generation bar takers uh, was higher uh, than for those who did not participate in this intervention. Um, so we're, uh, as Donna mentioned, it has been um, offered for the uh, last uh, few cycles of the bar exam and will be offered again uh, this July. Um, and then finally, on, for this slide, um, improving, uh, modifying the moral character determination process. There was an ad hoc moral character working group committee, uh, working group that um, finalized three separate documents, the moral character statement, the moral character determination guidelines, and best practices and talking points for law schools. Those three documents um, were approved by the Committee of Bar Examiners in April 2020, and then by the board in May. Uh, in the area of retention and advancement, um, the diversity summits, again, are an, a great opportunity for, for uh, the state bar to understand uh, what, what uh, issues are uh, in this area. Um, and um, as the board is very familiar with, um, the various efforts to address the racial disparities in the discipline system uh, with the FARCA study and the Robertson report. Um, and then uh, promoting judicial diversity, uh, we are continuing to support the Judicial Council in their efforts to advance, advance judicial diversity. Um, and in 2019, um, COAF uh, assisted the Judicial Council in updating their judicial diversity toolkit. Um, so now looking forward um, to 2021 and 2022 um, and the activities that we have planned, uh, for statewide leadership. Uh, we are uh, very uh, excited to be able to publish the second annual report card on the diversity of California's legal profession uh, next month. Um, we are very excited that this will be um, a report card that is published online in an interactive format so that um, stakeholders can really go in and um, do a deep dive into the data that is most relevant to them and most useful to them. Uh, we are also planning to include sector specific calls to action based on the diversity summits that we've held um, so far. Um, we are also working on a 2020 impact survey, which focuses on the impacts of both the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased national emphasis on racial justice issues on attorneys. Um, as some of you might recall, um, in 2007, 2008, with the Great Recession, there was a lot, there was a big impact on DEI efforts uh, in, in law firms in particular. And so we wanted to um, survey California attorneys to better understand um, how, how the pandemic um, has, has impacted them. Uh, that survey was closed in April, and so we are uh, analyzing the results now and we'll um, report the findings shortly. And uh, with diversity summits uh, for 2021, we have a government and public sector summit, which is scheduled for May 27th, uh, and we will um, uh, host additional convenings um, to share out the report card findings and impact survey findings um, later this year. Uh, We're also hoping to engage with local and affinity bars to support their efforts to have localized events that are similar to our statewide ones. Uh, so this is an important and very exciting um, initiative that we hope to launch this year. Uh, the DEI Leadership Seal Program um, is a program that we're uh, developing based on the calls to action to encourage legal employers to set and publicly commit to measurable diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. Um, 
We anticipate that initially um, it will be um, an aspirational program where um, legal employers will commit to um, the goals, uh, but we hope that over time um, uh, legal employers will be able to implement actionable measures to demonstrate their commitment and be held accountable uh, for their progress in this area. In the area of pipeline to the profession, um, we're continuing to uh, work with the California accredited and registered schools on their enhanced reporting. Um, and then we are also working on a multi-year law school retention study. Um, and so this includes a law school survey that we um, uh, had uh, opened uh, to the law schools last fall to gather information about the supports that they provide to the uh, to their students, particularly diverse students. Um, and then we will also analyze the retention data from the American Bar Association uh, and California, Incredi California accredited and registered law schools with the goal to identify programs that are successful in supporting and retaining diverse students. Uh, we anticipate that this report will be um, available uh, this fall. Um, and as uh, Donna mentioned with the California Bar Exam Strategies and Stories Program, uh, we are um, very hopeful with the promising results of the first two um, uh, uh, implementations of, of the program. And so we are hoping to focus this year or in the next two years on um, seeking permanent funding to institutionalize the program uh, for February and July bar exams moving forward. Um, with uh, retention and advancement in the profession, again, uh, we, we uh, hope to um, have those diversity summits. Um, and then uh, there is an active attorney study uh, that um, we would like to uh, complete this year. Um, national data suggests that women of color, particularly black women, are highly likely to leave the profession within their first 10 years of, in the profession. Um, and so we wanted to examine the demographic and professional characteristics of attorneys who move to inactive status um, in ca California specifically. Um, we are also continuing those reform efforts to address disparities in the discipline system, uh, specifically implementing Professor Robertson's recommendations as approved by the board, um, as well as the work of the ad hoc commission on the discipline system. Um, and this activity uh, is in response to the justice gap study from 2019, which found that law student, uh, which found that student debt load caused a significant number of law students who enter law school with the goal of pursuing a career in the public interest, um, often seek other career options um, uh, uh, because of their debt load. Um, and so COAF, the Council on Access and Fairness, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission, in partnership with the California Access to Justice Commission, um, is now studying the viability and impact of loan repayment assistance programs and loan forgiveness on recruitment and, and retention, particularly in the nonprofit and public sector, um, really looking at this um, from a recruitment and retention standpoint, as well as um, how it impacts diversity in the profession. Um, and so they're in the early stages of developing recommendations currently um, and um, looking at various potential interventions and initiatives um, moving forward. Um, and then uh, we uh, pri continue to prioritize supporting judici the Judicial Council in its efforts to advance judicial diversity. Uh, the Judicial Council continues to hold uh, numerous presentations, um, including, a judicial, including judicial diversity trainings to the State Bar uh, Judicial Nominations Evaluation Committee. Um, and this is uh, my last slide, um, and it is uh, um, on the funding history and potential funding needs that we've identified. Um, so the primary source of funding um, for this work is the $2 elimination of bias opt-out fee. Um, and it generates approximately $300,000 a year, which uh, currently supports staff, uh, mostly in the Office of Access and Inclusion. Uh, it supports the work of COAF um, as well and our existing initiatives. Um, staff has also identified these potential funding needs, um, which uh, we think will be about $425,000 in on ongoing funding, um, as well as $100,000 um, in one time, uh, which, and the, so you can see here that uh, evaluation of law school retention initiatives would be a, a one-time uh, funding need, um, and then ongoing uh, 
we anticipate you know, outreach and communication support to share uh, the state bar data and reports, uh, supporting local and affinity bar summits uh, to replicate um, local events based on the statewide convenings, uh, two administrations of the California Strategies and Stories program, um, and based on Professor Robertson's recommendations and subject to um, board approval, um, we identify that it, it would cost approximately $200,000 uh, if we were to launch a pilot program uh, uh, for state bar appointed counsel for income qualifying attorneys um, in attorney discipline matters. Um, so with that, I thank you for your time and your attention. Um, and if there are questions, I'm happy to um, answer them at this time. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Questions, discussion, Melanie. Yes, I uh, first wanna say thank you to uh, Donna and the team. I know that I had raised this at our last board meeting in terms of the 171 page report being a consent agenda, a consent agenda item. So certainly appreciate that being called out. And I know that when we met to talk about diversity and inclusion about a week or so ago, I feel like time just runs together. Um, um, Elizabeth so graciously talked about it at a high level. I know at that point in time, the presentation had not been completed, but I did have a question um, because as I think through the report that I read and I think through the presentation that you offered, um, if someone was stepping in and not versed in that 171 page presentation, what would be the two to three things that you would highlight that would have a more direct connection with the with the biannual report that was given to the state legislature. And maybe that's something you can respond to today, or maybe that's something that needs to be pushed off into, for the future and you could follow up with me directly, but I would really love to understand that because that was kind of the crux of what um, I thought we would be receiving today was, was a, a really great high level of what went to the legislature, so. And if I've missed something, please let me know because I certainly do miss a lot of things. Um, so trustees, Shelby, just a, a clarification. Are, are you asking what are the like two or three high level takeaway points um, that we submit uh, of the of the report that we took to the if legislature? To, that... And maybe not points, maybe two to two to three underlying themes, because as I your your presentation was great. But as I was looking for a direct connection to what was submitted to the legislature, maybe I missed that. So if you could outline that for me, that would be great. And again, we don't have to take up time in this meeting, but that, that's certainly something that I want to touch on. Well, Elizabeth, let me, uh, is this the power the presentation you just did, is that kind of a summary of the report that was given to the legislature? Yes, yes or, it is, yes. Uh, so we would align with that. Mm -hmm, yeah, it aligns with the report that was submitted to the legislature. The, um, the report um, to the legislature included um, uh, a summary of the activities um, in the prior two years, uh, in addition to um, uh, our plans for the 2021 and 2022. So oh, in, in so response, oh, go ahead. No, please. Does that answer your question, Melanie, or is it? Not really, something? but I would not, no. not really, Mr. Chair, but Elizabeth, I think she was gonna say something, so I didn't want to cut her off. Okay. Uh, well, I, I was just gonna um, say, um, per perhaps I, I can, um, you know, check in with you directly um, to, to uh, try to better understand what uh, information would be most useful and helpful for you. Sure, and I, and I think before we check in, I, I would like to say just, I, I was expecting more of a direct correlation of what was submitted to the legislature. And if I missed it, you know, please, please bring that to my attention. But um, it, 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 it was a, a good strong report or presentation, but it wasn't in alignment with what I had anticipated as it related to what we submitted. So, thank you. Okay, uh, more discussion, questions? Oh, Arnie, Arnie. Just, just real quick, I was very interested in the, the student loan debt uh, um, aspect that you, uh, that I think we're gonna do some additional research and, and, uh, and study on. And just uh, the clarification for me is this, is are these folks that have actually gone through law school and because of the burden of student debt um, have then uh, separated themselves uh, from the profession, the law profession, or, are these, or, or is the study of uh, folks that may um, 
uh, may wish to go into law, into the law, but because of the burden of student loan debt, would not would not mm -hmm. do so. So um, our, the Justice Gap study looked at law students, so already in law school, um, uh, and looked at um, those students who had initially entered law school with, with the goal of either becoming a legal aid attorney or a public defender or a district attorney, you know, to uh, become a lawyer in the public interest. But then during the course of law school, because of the debt load um, and increasing, you know, responsibilities, uh, personal responsibilities uh, veered off of that career path, maybe maybe into the private sector, um, because um, uh, because they would not be able to, you know, make a living and support their families um, uh, be, uh, with the salaries uh, in the public sector uh, and in nonprofit, um, and so uh, that that is what the project now is looking at whether there are interventions or initiatives related to loan repayment assistance programs or loan forgiveness um, to see if that would help um, uh, with the re uh, retention and advancement of attorneys um, in the government and uh, nonprofit sectors. So just one more, just, just so I'm clear, they did finish. Yes. They, finished, they did finish, okay. Yes. Oh. Okay. Yeah, and that, that phenomenon that Elizabeth was describing is referred to as public interest drift, uh, where they went into law school with the intention of doing uh, and started to proceed through law school with the intention of doing public service and drifted away from that due to the debt load and the inability to afford to, um, to pay back their, their loans and meet their obligations with the salaries that they would be getting in um, legal services organizations or the public sector. Um, and the, the rate was extraordinarily high uh, of individuals who had, who had indicated that that was their initial interest and were unable to, to carry that out. Um, and we know that the need in the public sector for attorneys is so high um, we also know that the um, that the the study told us that the um, that uh, students of color had higher debt load, um, and um, and so that's certainly a concern if that it has uh, has students of color veering away from public service um, because of the higher debt load that they were carrying. Um, there is a um, a statutorily authorized program uh, for loan repayment assistance, but it's never been funded. Um, and so what, um, what the uh, coalition, the Council on Access and Fairness, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission, and um, the, the um, California Access to Justice Commission have been looking at are, are figuring out ways to develop a program, find funding for a program to be able to really launch a real uh, a loan repayment assistance program in California that will encourage people to uh, be able to stay in um, stay in public service and not uh, and not drift from that during law school to a higher paying private sector attorney job. And, and just one more question: Is did the study also tell us that this um, that there is a disproportionate impact in terms of the students of color or the uh, that would have gone into that uh, into public sector? Or they are or students of color or Law, law school graduates of color um, most disproportionately sort of affected by this? Yes, um, because, because um, st students of color graduating from law school um, tend to have higher debt loads um, and tend to also have, um, you know, uh, more potential financial responsibilities um, coming out of law school. And so, uh, we, we believe that it does have, have a disproportionate impact on students of color. Maybe, maybe um, I can be a little bit more specific and I, mm -hmm. my question wasn't very good, um, um, wasn't worded uh, very well. This public sector drift, um, do we know that there are um, more law school graduates of color that mm -hmm. go into the public sector and then drift away? Is that, uh, can, we, can we make that statement? So we do know, looking at the um, diversity report card and the uh, data that we've collected in the past, that um, that the that um, <clears throat> people of color are better represented in um, in the public sector than in the private sector, um, though they continue to be not well represented in. Um, leadership positions in the public sector uh, as they are not well represented in leadership positions in the um, private sector. So there is a there there is a greater percentage of people of color in the in the um, 
in the uh, nonprofit and public sector than in the private sector. Um, but uh, you know, I can't. We we can't sort of. I don't think we had data on on if they, if they were more affected um, by the. I, I would. I think we expect that they're more more subject to the public interest drift. And therefore, there would be even greater um, uh, percentages of people of color in the ranks of the public sector lawyers, um, but that, um, uh, but that they're also, you know, swayed from that due to the higher debt load. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, I'm just really very interested in the loan assistance program, and I have mentioned this to Elizabeth um, before I was um, appointed by Governor Brown to the state bar. I was appointed to as a trustee to the Health Professions Education Foundation. It is the only foundation created by the state solely to um, provide scholarships and loan repayments to health professionals who work or promise to work in underserved areas for the scholarships and for the loan repayment will be for those who are working in underserved areas. And having to go through the applications and looking through the, the, the candidates, you know, they, you know, they were once in, in these underserved areas and instead of going to private uh, practices, they would come back to their communities. And it was amazing really. Um, so I really am very, very interested in, you know, hopefully that we can get this loan repayment program, uh, you know, instituted. That's all I can say, thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Anyone else? Uh, Mark Tony. Uh, you're on, you're on mute, Mark. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to give an example. Let's look at page 14 of this report. Okay. Um, the title of page 14 is figure five, primary employment sector, yada, yada, yada. A lot of categories. Okay. And what is the conclusion that you want the reading public, the audience to get from this chart? Oh, sorry, Trustee Tony. I was just I was just pulling up the chart so that I could be um, at the exact you. thing that you are commenting on. Let, let me ask. You want me to ask again? Um. Uh. uh sure. Okay. It's um. What's the takeaway that that when 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 you know someone reads this, let's say a. Um, a legislative staffer, okay? I don't think everybody in the world is gonna read this, okay? But let's say a legislative staffer will read this. What's the takeaway? What's the, what do you want them to get from this page? What is your goal? Um, so from this page specifically, we wanted to um, show um, by sector, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, um, uh, and um, you know, sexual orientation, uh, people with disabilities, um, and to point out that the majority of the profession is um, in the private sector, um, and that the the two smallest sectors, the government sector and the nonprofit sector, um, are the most diverse. And um, and even if in that situation, even though that they're, they're most diverse sectors, that um, there's still underrepresentation in leadership levels in those sectors. And and so, if I may, um, this is also um, from our from the data that we gathered for the um, the first uh, report card on the diversity in the profession, which was intended to set a baseline um, for uh, taking a look at the diversity of the profession, so we could look at trends over time. Um, and so this was sort of, we took various opportunities to slice and dice the data, looking at uh, the makeup of the, uh, of the profession and how it compared to the makeup of the adult population as a whole, looking at the makeup of uh, the lower ranks in the private sector, nonprofit and government versus leadership and how, um, and how, that, um, that, how that looked. We looked at career satisfaction, 
um, by race, ethnicity, and gender, sort of a, a variety of things really, to, uh, to identify a baseline and ultimately to help us um, identify um, areas where interventions might be successful. So for example, if the data told us that, um, that um, um, you know, uh, Asian women left the profession or you know, uh, had, highest, had the lowest career satisfaction in um, uh, certain categories of career satisfaction, um, that would be that would be telling, and it would be something for us to explore, whether it's with nonprofit sector, private sector, government sector, wherever that that uh, level of um, of dissatisfaction is the greatest. Um, because what we don't want to see um, is people of color leaving the profession um, at higher rates than people not of color leaving the profession. We want to make sure that the profession is uh, creates an inclusive environment, so people of color want to join the profession feel that they have a path to success and career advancement. And so, uh, so here we were laying out um, uh, the data that we concluded as a result of that first analysis so we can begin doing trend analysis going forward. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with uh, figure five and I'm gonna um, give an example of the black African-American bar. So I think at first glance, it says that um, it, what it appears to say is that law for 24% of the employees at law firms um, are African-American of private law firms. I'm saying, boy, I don't, you know, I, I don't know which, which corporate law firms that is. And, you know, maybe 23% of so, 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 so like, can I, can I interrupt? This is, this is very confusing to read. And I actually, let me, let me finish here because I then after studying this more realized that what it's trying to say is that of all the African-Americans of all the black attorneys in the whole field, it happens that 24% of them happen to work at law firms. I think that's what it really is saying. Is that, that's more like it, right? Yes. But, but, but when you just look at this, you, if you just look at these numbers in isolation, you say, well, you know, looks like the uh, private law firms are doing okay. They got a court, you know, the, you know of all the um, uh, black attorneys, there's 24% of them there. Um, I, I actually don't count the solar practitioner as an employer, but that's just me. Um, and then, you know, the, the other percentages. But then if you compare it to the data on page 10, which is where you have the baseline, which is the primary employment sector for, for California attorneys, you see that 38% of all um, uh, um, attorneys are employed at the, um, uh, at, at, at the um, law firms, then, then, then you realize that actually uh, black attorneys are underrepresented in law firms. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that you have to really carefully read this and do the math to reach that conclusion. And I, I just want to suggest in the future that as you present the information, you, you, you make it a little easier for people to figure out where are people adequately, different categories, adequately represented, where are they underrepresented? Because you have to do a lot of work to figure out the meaning of figure five. And I don't think most people do the math when they're looking at a set of charts. Uh, that, that requires multiple pages. So it's just my comment. Uh, and so I would, I would point you um, to page, I think page 15, um, where it is sort of looking by sector and looking at uh, the relative representation of women of color, men of color, white women, white men uh, by sector. 
there were quite a number of ways that we um, sliced and diced the data uh, in the uh, in the diversity report card and certainly uh, in this report. Um, I, I did want to also acknowledge the work of the um, leadership of the Council on Access and Fairness in helping um, uh, put together both the diversity report card and um, and this report. Um, they gave us quite a lot of their time in um, in ensuring that that they that they thought that that the um, that it was delivering a, a effective messages. So we will certainly take a look for the um, the next report card will be somewhat different. As Elizabeth mentioned, it will be um, uh, put together in an interactive uh, format, so you can sort of go in and slice and dice the data in your own ways, um, depending on what are some of the factors that you want to learn from. Right? Maybe you want to learn about about large private firms, so you can see how your firm. Uh, uh, stacks up, um, but uh, so so that may be a little different. But we'll certainly uh, take those words into consideration and make sure that uh, we think that it is uh, effectively depicting the message, not just in the uh, narrative, but also in the graphics. Yeah, and just to clarify, so um, Mark, because on the, for the chart on page fourteen, you mentioned partners in firms. I don't think that's what the statistic here is. It's for its employment. So I assume it includes partners, even though they're technically not employees. But um, yeah. so that's, you know, any black or African American person who is working in any capacity at a law firm, that's 24% of that population is working, sorry, not even at a law firm in the private sector, they could be working for an accounting firm, uh, you know, there are other places where lawyers work, but I'm sure the vast majority is, is law firms, yeah. So, and we know from our other work that if we, if we had a, if we, uh, that, that uh, Black and African American attorneys are underrepresented in the partnerships of larger law firms. We know that for sure. And I'm, if, I'm sure there's a graphic on this in that report somewhere, I've seen it multiple times. Well, I'll work with my fellow sociologist, uh, Dag, to uh, uh, share, share, share some thoughts that I got on data uh, presentation. All right, very good. Um, anyone else? All right, um, Elizabeth, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was very good. It's a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in this area. I know putting together this, the report was a, was a lot of work and I thank everyone who's both working on the substantive activities that, we're, that we talked about as well as the reporting. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, next up is item 704, a uh, report on metrics from uh, Donna and Lisa Chavez. So we need to bring Lisa in. So Welcome, I'm Lisa. Gonna, I will just introduce the item and let Lisa do all the heavy lifting. Um, so uh, as you'll recall, at the last board meeting, uh, we presented the metrics uh, for all but uh, key pieces of the discipline system. Um, uh, for, and these were the year-end metrics for 2020 largely, or the, or the fourth quarter of 2020 metrics. Uh, uh, as, uh, as we indicated at the time, uh, while we were finalizing all the data with, for the annual discipline report, um, we delayed putting out the those metrics uh, that related to the discipline system, we wanted to ensure uh, that the data was, was entirely consistent. And so uh, this report is just that piece of the metrics report that related to the discipline system that we were unable to present at the March meeting. And with that, I turn it over to Lisa. Hi, good afternoon. I'll share my screen and we can get started. Just... Okay. 
Okay, so as Donna mentioned, we pulled, we held back uh, discipline system metrics from that last metrics report, and um, we're going to report on them today. In particular, we're going to report uh, focus on the state bar court probation and client security fund, uh, because the OCTC metrics, a lot of them were also in the ADR for which you received thorough presentation, and it turns out that the lawyer assistance program we did report on their metrics in the last metrics report. Um, but overall, across all five of these offices, they have 33 metrics uh, between them. 22 of the metrics have targets. And what we mean by that is that the metric has a goal or a target that it's shooting, shooting for. So, um, however, there's uh, some, some metrics that don't have a target, but yet we report them regularly for uh, simply reporting purposes and for information. So out of these 22 metrics that had, tar had targets, five of them missed their targets. And our practice is, is to um, understand the reasons why uh, they missed a target and to uh, illuminate how offices are planning to improve and meet that target next time. So let's start with Kate. Pro I'm going to start with giving some highlights of metrics that did meet their targets. Um, so here's uh, two metrics for the state bar court. And in particular, these metrics, um, these metrics here have to do with the review department. And on the left, this is a metric that says that the, they have a goal uh, that 90% of the cases will be processed within case type timeline. So, you know, different cases have different timelines. And so what this shows is that for the months that we analyzed, um, all, of, all of these, uh, they actually exceeded their goal. So 100% of the cases were processed within their timelines. The, on the right, um, this is actually a, a metric that's being a little bit more lenient where it's saying, okay, well, if you can't do it within the case timelines, how about within 150% time of the times? But in that case, 100% of them will be processed within, you know, 1.5, you know, times of the timeline. And so as you can see, um, they're successful there. The Client Security Fund um, has two metrics for which they met their targets. On the left, uh, this is a metric where on an annual basis, the office um, sets a goal for themselves on reducing the amount of time it takes uh, to go from jurisdiction to resolution of a case. And so this year they set a target that they were going to reduce the amount of time by 5%. And then for 2020, they actually exceeded that goal and reduced it by 13%. So in 2020, the client security fund resolved nearly 1300 cases. And so they reduced the amount of time by uh, that resolving those 1300 cases by uh, 13%. And on the right, they met their goal of providing status update to all applicants at least twice a year. And so the client security fund actually reached out to over 2100 applicants and met that target. Here's an example of metrics that don't have targets and they actually both pertain to pr the probation department. On the left, it's a simple reporting on a quarterly basis, the percent of all probation cases that were completed successfully. And on the right, um, this is actually measuring the successful completion of restitution by different quarters. And then it's actually even disaggregated further that the success of completion was a complete pay payment of restitution or what is that? I'm covering myself, complete or partial payment. So again, this is an example where we don't have targets because I think that, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why some metrics don't have targets versus others. In some cases, it's appropriate to have a target. So in other cases, it's not. And these, were, these are examples where, we, where uh, metrics don't have targets. So now I'm going to turn to a set of metrics that didn't really meet their targets. And when we reached out to their offices, we learned that the reasons why it were really related to the pandemic. So let's look at the uh, metric for state bar court. This is um, like OCTC, they have a metric that ma measures the annual caseload clearance rate and we measure it on a monthly basis. And case an annual caseload clearance rate is actually different from a traditional caseload clearance rate, whereas um, an annual caseload clearance rate takes into account the average of the previous 12 months caseload clearance rate. So that's gonna take into account like kind of smoothing out some highs and lows that an office may have. And so if you look at December, 2020, um, that 96% is actually the average of the previous 12 months. And that of course took, was during the months of the pandemic and in particular when the office was closed. 
And so in particular, um, the State Bar Office closure led to abating 150 cases. And so the court expects caseload clearance rates to remain irregular for the next several months while they recover from uh, these ca case abatements. The client security fund also was impacted by the pandemic, um, despite you know, the previous success in those other measures. Um, here, they set a goal for uh, every year, they set a goal for how many cases they're going to resolve. They set a target to resolve 1,350 cases and they just missed their goal, uh, but they only resolved a 1,319. And they attribute it to uh, the delays in investigations due to needing to give um, applicants and respondents more time to provide information, especially during the, uh, when we had shelter in place. And also, um, even though they were, the goal was to hire some temporary staff to help you know, resolve these cases, um, there's a, they deal with a lot of original documentation that comes mailed into the office and they just weren't comfortable with sending any of that document, documentation offsite during the shelter in place. Okay, so now I'm gonna to turn to two more metrics um, and these pertain to the state bar court. And sometimes metrics, there's no real reason for um, meeting them other than say like a procedural issue. And, but again, our offices are really good at describing them. So in this case, the hearing department in the state bar court has this similar metric to the review department. That is 90% of cases will be processed within case time timelines. And as you can see, they met it for every month that we analyzed with exception of November. And that month, the hearing department closed 39 cases but they were able to go into their files and dock and as you can see, they nearly met it, 87%. Um, so they determined that five of them were delayed for these reasons right here. You know, parties requesting good cause continuances, multiple judi judicial assignments and case processing error. Whoops. And then finally, again, you know, they have, we have another metric related to the hearing department case processing process 100% of the cases within 150% time. And as you can see, barely missed it. And it was really like within each month, it was just one case that preventing them from hitting that 100% goal. And um, they looked at their um, records and determined that all four of the cases, one per month was due to this reason right here. Parties requesting good cause continuances due to due process. Okay. So that's, that's our metrics report for this time. And um, usually we dig into these discipline system metrics at RAD um, a little bit more deeply, but it's really uh, great to also be, be able to present uh, to the full board. Does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, any comments or, actually, if you could turn off screen sharing, that would be sure. great. Thank you. Um, any comments, discussion, questions? Not seeing any. Okay, so let me just pause for a moment. We've got um, three items remaining. We've been going for about an hour and a half. Do people feel like they'd like to have a break? Maybe a quick five minute break? Yeah, I think so. All right. So. Uh, let's come back. Uh, let's, um, it'll be nine minutes. Let's come back at 2.45. All right, see you at 2.45.
live, so we're going to get rolling again. All right. Um, we will take up next item 705 regarding proposed state bar rule 3.453 governing uh, regarding client security fund matters. Uh, And Gagan Kaur is going to present. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm sorry if I got that wrong. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, th this is Gagan Kaur. I'm with OGC and I'll be presenting this item. Uh, this item requests board's approval for the permanent adoption of the Client Security Fund Rule 3.453. As you may recall, um, on March 19, 2021, the board adopted this rule on an emergency interim basis and concurrently authorized a 30-day public comment period for its permanent adoption. Uh, this rule allows 120 non-disbarred, non-resigned licensees whose actions have resulted in reimbursements to clients um, by CSF to request a payment plan for any outstanding interest on such reimbursements. Um, these licensees have to meet a criteria that's specified in the rule, as well as agree to the terms and conditions that are set forth in this rule. Um, and the reason this rule is being implemented is to afford equitable relief to these licensees because their outstanding CSF reimbursement has accrued significant interest prior to being added to their license fee or to their fee statements. Now, during this 30-day public comment period, we received one public comment. Um, which did not address the substance of the rule. The commenter stated, and I'm quoting, 10% interest is too much. If interest is charged, it should be two to 3% per annum. The quotations end there. So this comment is immaterial to this rule because this rule doesn't set the interest for CSF reimbursements. Interest is set yearly by the board pursuant to a different CSF rule, um, rule 3.451. So, the fact that this one comment doesn't really address the substance of the rule, the staff requests and recommends proceeding with the permanent adoption of Rule 3.453. And if there's any questions on this item, I'm happy to address those at this time. Okay, questions, comments? Not seeing any. Um, Chair, yeah. Mr. Chair, would you like me to screen share the resolution? Sure. Uh, Chair, this is Jose Cisneros. I will make the motion, and I uh, believe this will bring relief to uh, some of these attorneys that are facing these uh, large uh, bills. Hopefully, this will help them get it under control. So moved. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, and thank you Tony, for your work on second. this. Tony, second. Mark Tony. Jose moves. Mark Tony seconds. Uh, unless there's any further discussion, I can't see all your videos now. So either use the raise hand function or speak up. Uh, hearing nothing, uh, Sarah, please take the roll. Rotten. Yes. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. De La Cruz. Trustee De La Cruz has uh, left the meeting. Dellen? Yes. Duran? Yes. And Trustee Pertula has advised me that he um, will be absent for the rest of the meeting, so I'll mark him absent for the duration. Um, Shelby? Aye. Sowell? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Next up is item 706, proposed revised accredited law school rules. I think the staff who's presenting will uh, be brought into the room momentarily.
hopefully. Sarah is, uh, or Dag? Um, ah, they, they're, they're in the process of joining. It's Audrey okay. Ching and Natalie Leonard. All right, welcome Audrey and Natalie. Have at it. <laughs> Hello, um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, we're here back with the revised accredited rules um, with returning from public comment. Um, with me is Natalie Leonard, our principal program analyst, and I'm the assistant director for the Office of Admissions. We also will have Ken Holloway from the Office of General Counsel. And I'm gonna share my screen for our presentation and um, Natalie will take it away. Terrific, uh, thank you, Audrey. And in the background, if we could also promote uh, Ken Holloway so he can be available. Um, if there are any questions, that would be terrific. So as Audrey said, uh, today we're requesting adoption of the proposed revised rules for accrediting California law schools. Uh, this proposed rule set would completely replace the current rules for accredited law schools. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've talked about this proposal with the board before the board authorized public comment, but we'll just quickly summarize the path uh, that was taken in order to get to this point, uh, what the purpose was, how it was developed with significant public participation over the last two years, uh, the four key purposes for accreditation that are embodied in the current rules, and um, now that the rule set has come back from public comment, a discussion of the public comment received, um, several technical staff amendments for clarity that uh, we recommend for adoption, um, and uh, as does the committee of bar examiners, and a proposed implementation plan for this large package of rules. Next slide. Thank you. So this initiative was undertaken at the request of the board, and it was designed to ensure that the rules support modern purposes for accreditation, that they incorporate best practices in accreditation, and they also create a framework to recognize law schools that are accredited by regional or national institutional accreditors. Next slide, please. In terms of the way that the proposal was created, uh, because it was a full replacement of the rules, uh, staff and the committee of bar examiners sought a significant amount of public participation. And uh, we can go on to the next slide and talk about some of the groups that were participating. Over the course of two years, the committee on state bar accredited and registered schools met 11 times in public meetings. Uh, the Presentations and work of those committees were further discussed at the Committee of Bar Examiners with additional discussion. And uh, I'd also like to particularly thank the Council on Access and Fairness, as well as the Office of Access and Inclusion, who helped with the inclusion of a new section of the rules on diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, which has always been a goal of these particular sectors of schools, but um, has never been codified before as a part of the rules. So we're very excited about that. Next slide, please. In order to create the rules, uh, they took a very holistic uh, point of view, starting back at the beginning, thinking about the state bar mission and why the state bar participates in law school accreditation. Uh, they reviewed the best practices of professional accreditors, national accreditors, and professional accreditors in a wide range of areas, uh, medical, nursing, uh, many other areas, engineering, to figure out what was going on today in accreditation, what was working out well, and what should uh, the State Bar be thinking about for the future. Uh, we also reviewed the committee requests from the Committee of Bar Examiners that had been made over the years regarding the rules going back um, over three years. Um, ultimately identifying four key purposes for law school accreditation and making sure that these new rules focused on those purposes and um, let go of any rules that did not foster these purposes. Okay, next slide, please. If we go on to the next slide. Yes, trying, sorry, I don't know what happened. One second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> While Audrey's doing that, we can talk about uh, what the next slide would share. It would talk about the four key purposes and uh, they are, oh, here we go. All right, we can go one more. Consumer protection and transparency, student success, of course, 
and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and preparation for licensure and professionalism. Uh, by professionalism, we mean a preparation for practice and also ethical practice. Uh, next slide. A jointly accredited option will be available for schools that um, are part of an institution that's accredited by a national um, accreditor or regional accreditor, such as the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. Uh, those accreditors uh, focus on the institution as a whole and make sure healthy systems are in place to ensure student success. And uh, we'd like to be able to recognize that in a way the State Bar has not been able to do previously. The, school, the uh, schools that are part of this program would still be responsible to the State Bar. They would submit an annual report and they would still need to, uh, to comply with core principles such as the minimum cumulative bar pass rate. And on the next slide, we'll see a little bit more about what those core rules are. Um, I won't go through all of them because they're uh, a somewhat lengthy list, uh, but these are the key programmatic elements that might not otherwise be addressed by the institutional accreditor so that this way, when a school is jointly accredited, the oversight will still be fully complete. Okay, next slide. Uh, today, we're here to talk about public comment received and also several technical amendments that were proposed by staff and to request adoption of the rules as presented today in your item. Next slide, please. Uh, with a, a series of public comment periods over the last two years, it's not surprising that only five comments uh, were received. Uh, two were received from deans of unaccredited law schools, though these are um, actually accredited rules. Uh, they had to do with, uh, the first comment had to do with questions that will actually be addressed in the guidelines in terms of the specific materials uh, that must be included when a school is jointly accredited. Um, and in addition, it had some helpful suggestions for schools that are in jeopardy of losing their accreditation um, that are also under consideration uh, for guidelines. One JD graduate also submitted a comment uh, regarding the uh, complaint process that is embedded in the rules. Um, this complaint process mirrors the ABA process as well. Um, and we think that the process that is in place right now is appropriate. And that particular um, individual uh, received uh, quite a bit of um, follow-up uh, regarding the questions that they raised. Uh, one anonymous student wanted a specific timeline for the return of grades, uh, but because each school uh, is different in terms of their semester, uh, it was not realistic to put a specific timeline, uh, but rest assured that one of the elements of the rules is to require a prompt, thorough, efficient, and helpful feedback uh, from faculty at a time that's helpful for students. Um, and then we also received comments from a licensee about the Office of Admissions and about testing in general that were outside the substance of these rules. Uh, overall, four supported other than that final licensee. And uh, we shared this with CS bars in addition to the Committee of Bar Examiners. And uh, no changes are recommended based on the public comment uh, from either CBE or CS bars. Next slide. Staff did uh, propose several technical amendments that are redlined in the document for your review. Uh, since the item went out uh, for public comment, they were actually not suggested in response to the public comment, but rather uh, they were technical amendments uh, designed to improve clarity. And um, we have brought along uh, Ken uh, Holloway from our Office of General Counsel uh, to talk about uh, why we believe that these do not need to go out for public comment uh, since they are simply technical and non-substantive. You can go forward Thanks. to the next slide. And thank you, Ken. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. Uh, I'm Ken Holloway from the Office of General Counsel. Uh, Natalie invited me just to highlight uh, one, one fact that's in the, in the agenda item. Uh, under State Bar Rule 1.10, uh, if an item has been out for run, one round of public comment, um, it need not go for additional public comment for changes uh, if the board deems those changes to be non-substantive or reasonably implicit in the proposal. Uh, for these technical amendments, uh, staff sought council review uh, and Office of General Counsel and, and staff took a look and are in agreement that uh, all the technical amendments are either non-substantive or uh, reasonably implicit in the proposal. 
uh, they're all being offered for clarification. Uh, and again, we just uh, wanted to point that out that the uh, the board can uh, uh, can move forward without another round of public comment in that case. Thank you, Ken. I want to point out that my staff is not in a tropical clime. Uh, that is a virtual background. <laughs> Don't spoil the illusion. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> All right. Well, perhaps he just felt such enjoyment reviewing the five comments uh, that were requested by the Office of Admissions, and we thank the Office of General Counsel for their efforts. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> uh, we can go one more, uh, if justice counts. Uh, in terms of, rec if you should decide to go forward to adopt these, we wanted to talk about a potential timeline. I uh, hear because it is a full, full rules package. Next slide, please. It's recommended that these would be implemented on January 1st, a uh, reason being uh, we would be able to get one more full set of annual reporting under the current rules and schools would have a sufficient amount of time to prepare. Uh, currently, in particular, the fixed facility schools are operating under um, a waiver to take the health steps that they need to through January 1st as a result of the COVID pandemic. And it's hoped that things will be um, back uh, more to a typical order by January 1, 2022. Uh, in terms of the phase-in period, it may take time for some of the requirements uh, to be fully met and is proposed that there would be a two-year phase-in period through 2024. And for those schools that are in the process of seeking accreditation, uh, and we expect there may be two such schools this year, uh, that they would be uh, required to seek full compliance with the new rules uh, if they did not achieve compliance prior to January 1st. And um, next slide. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, uh, let's turn off the screen sharing, please. And then uh, yeah. comments, questions from board members. Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> an ill-timed Ill or rightly timed uh, ringtone. I think we'd all uh, wanna be at a beach right now too. So, um, Natalie, thank you uh, to you and your team for all, all of your work on this. Um, I had some questions that, that came to mind in looking at your presentation. Um, one, uh, minimum cumulative bar passage rate. Um, what, is, what is that and what is the rate? I'm sorry, I had a little technical difficulty. I heard you to ask about the minimum cumulative pass rate and something else, if you wouldn't mind repeating. Yeah, just when you say minimum cumulative bar passage rate, uh, what does that mean? And then also what would that rate be set at? Uh, thank you. Okay, so that's actually a continuation of a current rate. And um, that right now is set at, it's a 40% it's a cumulative pass rate over five years. It was first implemented, it was discussed in 2015. I was implemented um, shortly thereafter during that year. Um, and schools have been reporting that for a number of years. Um, so at this point, it's suggested not to change. Um, and that pass rate is something that we encourage prospective students uh, and the public to look to posted on the admissions website. Uh, it is at 40%. Um, by a comparison, uh, the ABA standard would be a 75% over two years uh, for each individual class. The state bar pass rate is more flexible um, to allow for the wider range of circumstances and the wider range of score profiles that can be accepted by these schools. And then the um, library requirements. Um, you know, we, we live in a technological age. Um, the uh, you know majority of practitioners don't even possess you know that large of a written law library. What would qualify as a electronic um, library to uh, meet that requirement? 
Sure. So uh, for most of the schools, they, they're offering their materials through Alexis or Westlaw. A few are using a, one in particular, using Cali and Fastcase uh, for general materials. And then they can also have additional electronic subscriptions. They're also required to have a free copy of their textbooks available as well to the students, free access. Yes. And then one more uh, question regarding costs. Um, so with the site visits um, that um, would be required under this rule, and then also the Are there site any visits. Other questions? Oh, did I, did I freeze? For a moment, uh, I, I hear you. there's a question about site visits. Yes, sorry about that. Yeah, so what, have you conducted a study on how much site visits would cost uh, when going to conduct these uh, checks? Uh, we do site visits right now. We do them for both the accredited and the unaccredited schools. And in fact, during this year, as a result of the pandemic, we've been doing them online. Um, the schools are billed on an hourly rate, uh, depending on how long the inspections take. Um, and we are actually in the process of uh, working on a more standardized template to make sure that the cost and the time invested um, is as efficient as possible, balancing the need to get a very good result from the inspection. I think that's been the main concern that I've heard, and um, especially for schools who are trying to uh, reduce costs as much as possible so they can reach out to uh, economically disadvantaged communities. Um, you know, it's, I think it's a very real concern that these costs could mount <laughs> and, um, you know, would make it prohibitive, uh, cost prohibitive uh, to maintain, um, you know, their, their doors being open. So um, when do you expect this um, you know, further uh, study or, or reports on making sure that those standardized costs are, are, uh, are maintained? Um, there's not a specific study in place. Uh, it's an ongoing thing uh, that we've been doing and we are beginning to see somewhat of a reduction in the cost uh, build for the accredited inspections. And we're in the process right now of creating a new set of templates, as well as a free online preparation webinar, also for the unaccredited law schools uh, to help them prepare most efficiently for their inspections. And uh, that's yeah, something yeah. that we would certainly be happy to bring uh, back to the board for further discussion. And I also do agree that um, since uh, the committee allowed the libraries to go electronic in 2019, uh, the accredited law schools have been very pleased, students have been very pleased, and there's been a cost reduction as a result of that uh, to the schools. Um, great, thank you. All right, uh, more discussion, questions? Uh, if not, I assume we have a proposed resolution. You can put that up on the screen. Thank you, Sarah. Sure, there it is. All right, is anyone in a motion making mood? Uh, Sean, this is Brandon. I would make a motion, but I would also wanna amend the motion to add uh, something that, that comports with what uh, Natalie and I just talked about, which as far as bringing back the site visit issue before the board and um, you know, making sure that there's, there's that uh, standardized streamlined process. Um, Brandon, can you give me language? I'm sorry, I was a little bit distracted during that time. Uh, further resolved that the office um, this would be office of admissions correct okay office of admissions report back to the board on steps taken to standardize site cost visits and to keep the board informed of any substantial cost or unexpected um, I guess developments 
this is why sausage shouldn't be made on the fly. So my, my apologies. <laughs> Okay, and as a practical matter, just keep in mind too that when um, an inspection is a very clean and everything is in order, uh, it generally can be conducted more efficiently than when a school needs additional support. So you may see a difference from school to school uh, where that additional support is needed. All right, thank you, Brandon. We have a motion. Do I hear a second? Sonia, second. All right, motion by Brandon, second by Sonia. Discussion. Uh, I can't see all your uh, videos, so use the raise hand or speak up. Brandon. So, Sean, if I, Sean, if I could, this you know dates back as Natalie was talking about uh, several years, and it's something that I really uh, strongly believe in. I'm a graduate of a non-accredited law school. Uh, something that I I made a, a conscious choice to pursue because I didn't want to come out with large amounts of law school debt and uh, wanted to be able to work in an area that didn't constrain me to um, the, you know, a place that paid the most money. And so uh, I, was, I was reminded of this when uh, Trustee Sowell was talking about um, you know, student debt load and how that impacts people's career arcs and choices and really being able to work with people uh, that they feel called to, to work with. And so I'm very pleased that the State Bar is continuing to accredit law schools were one of the few jurisdictions that do. This is something where I think that the rest of the US, uh, uh, rest of the states in the United States are starting to look at and to, um, to take note of what the work that the state bar is doing to increase diversity in the profession uh, in many areas, including that of access to uh, a legal education. And so I really think that the state bar is at the forefront of this. And I'm glad that we're continuing to hold this banner. I wanna thank all of the uh, staff of the State Bar and then uh, everybody who collaborated uh, on this project, because I know it was a massive undertaking. It was one that uh, there were a, lot of, uh, a lot of emotions on both sides, a lot of uh, passion and fire. And I really think that um, you know, there, this was a good meeting of the minds and um, a good chance for Cal Californians to continue to um, have access to um, to being a lawyer. And I'm kind of reminded of, uh, I think it's 21 Jump Street, where uh, one of the characters is asked to uh, recite the Miranda rights. And uh, one of the Miranda rights is incorrectly cited as, you have the right to be a lawyer. And uh, like, oh wait, that's not a, that's not a right. But um, here in California, access to a legal education and one that's affordable is something that I think should be at the forefront of, of our work and it's gonna be, be allowed to do so, I believe through, uh, through these rules. So thank you to staff for your work. Greatly appreciate your support. All right, anyone else? Okay, uh, Sarah, would you take the roll please? Broughton. Yes. Chen. I do not see her, so I will note that. I apologize. She stepped oh. out. She'll be back. She'll be back as soon as she can. Oh, okay. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Cisneros. Hi. Uh, Della Cruz. Still absent. Okay. Dellen. Yes. Duran. Yes. Um, Shelby. Aye. Sowell. Aye. Stallings. Yes. Tony. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, can you go ahead and turn off the screen sharing? And we are nearing the finish line. We're gonna move on to our last item for today, uh, which is item 707, closing the adding uh, members to the closing the justice gap working group. Uh, Donna and Randy Diefentorum are going to we're slated to present on this. And Randy is now in. Chair. Sure. Welcome, Randy. Good afternoon, everybody. Randy, do you want to take it away or do you want me to lead off? I'm happy, I'm happy to take it away. Go for it. 
The Closing the Justice Gap Working Group has been meeting uh, since January. They've actually had three full plenary session meetings, uh, January 14th, February 19th, April 9th. They've formed two subcommittees uh, to initiate uh, all the work in the board's charter. The two subcommittees are a scope subcommittee to uh, explore the dimensions of the sandbox, what ought to be considered in the sandbox, what's considered outside the sandbox, what's the articulated purpose and mission of the sandbox, and another subcommittee known as the uh, SAGE subcommittee, uh, which stands for Structure and Governance, uh, Education and Enforcement. And that subcommittee has begun looking at what this temporary pilot program uh, regulatory structure uh, should be formed as and what should be uh, some of the uh, data collection and other steps taken uh, for implementing essentially a uh, risk-based uh, regulation for the sandbox participants. And the subcommittees uh, have had about four meetings um, to date and the next meeting of the full uh, working group uh, is June 18th. And what's been learned in the leadership uh, meetings since the start of this important project is that we could probably use a, a little bit uh, more in terms of uh, input from those who are on the uh, front line, so to speak, of delivery of legal services to people uh, who are underserved on this particular agenda item is simply asking that the working group uh, be allowed to expand its membership by up to five members and to target additional members uh, who would uh, fit that goal. And so representatives from a community-based organization, domestic violence shelter or social services organization or similar professional provides guidance in legal matters or social services to persons whose issues involve uh, legal problems. Uh, also a representative from a court-based self-help center, and then trial judges, including retired judicial officers with experience in non-criminal proceedings uh, who see what happens when you have uh, unrepresented or pro se litigants uh, come before them. Uh, we would ask also the agenda item mentions and the resolution provides that the chair of the uh, working group uh, be authorized, delegated the authority to make these up to five appointments in consultation with the board liaisons. And just to give a little sort of recent history perspective, um, the board back uh, in November of 2020 received a similar request from the Car California Power Professional Working Group and uh, was uh, a situation where they also needed some additional troops to carry out the work and the board uh, agreed uh, to expand that group and to delegate to the chair the ability to make those appointments. And that is essentially what uh, the chair and the leadership of the Closing the Justice Scrap Working Group is asking of you today. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, questions or comments? Not seeing anyone, all right. Um, Sarah, can you put up the proposed resolution, please? Uh, this is Jose, I'll make the motion. Thank you. Shelby, I'll second. All right, motion by Jose, second by Melanie. Any further discussion? Remember, I can't see your video for most of you. No. Hey, Sean, Melanie? this is... Sean, this is Brandon. Uh, so I did talk with, um, I think it was Donna and Sarah about this um, and the addition of the board appoint appointment liaisons being a part of this process. And, you know, with the, with the state bar having a different diversity objectives, I thought it was really important for um, our trustee, trustee liaisons to be able to speak to this issue and just to provide some oversight on that. And so I don't anticipate, um, you know, there's going to be issues in that area, but just wanted to make sure that um, that our uh, objectives as a board could continue, even with the appointment of, of members on this uh, working group. So I support this and thank staff for their work on it. Very good. Thanks, Brandon. 
Anyone else? Uh, all right, uh, Sarah, take the roll, please. Oh, Broughton. Sarah, we can take the roll. Oh, there Broughton. we go. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Chen. Okay, Cisneros. Aye. Dela Cruz. Dellen. Yes. Duran. Yes. Shelby. No. Uh. Yeah. Shelby. Aye. Sowell. I'm an aye. <laughs> Stallings. Yes. Tony. I'm Epstein. Epstein. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The motion carries. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so we've reached the end of our meeting for today. We're not going to adjourn. We're going to recess the meeting and continue tomorrow in open session beginning at nine, uh, solely to hear any public comment on the uh, one closed session item that we will take up tomorrow, which is 7002 Chief Trial Counsel finalist interviews. So again, we'll begin and open at nine. And then um, we will, once we hear any public comment, we'll go into closed session. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow.